end up here on stage, it's time to consider death. Not on Earth, but up there. Death in the bleak emptiness of infinite space, the final frontier. If you were a pioneer out in the old frontier days, out in the old west, you'd be buried out on the lone prairie. If you were a sailor, you'd be buried at sea. But what do you do if you die up there? What's to be done with the dead in space? I'll show you what I do. First, I would get a coffin. Not just any coffin. One suitable for eternal slumber in infinity itself. But what's a coffin without a body? Yours will do nicely. and a body. Now all we need is some light and a little magic. A final farewell. A coffin and a body floating in space. Surrounded by the dark mysteries of the universe, light years above the earth, until finally. Performance in a new town. It was a six, with plenty of room for improvement. Paul? Yeah, yeah, I know. Uh, spotlight should have been on you instead of the lady during the ring toss. It'll be there next time, I promise. All right, now, what happened just before intermission? Why to stall? Oh, it's the new belts. They are really hard to buckle. Everybody had a problem. Betty? I'm working on it, David. All right, thank you. And you were too far stage right during the finale. The spotlight almost missed you. I know, I'm sorry. I couldn't find my mark. I made it bigger. It won't happen again. I'm sorry. Thanks. All right, well, that's all I have. Anybody else have anything? Yeah, I do. I almost killed myself getting back on stage for the ice-cutting trick. Jake forgot to move the cabinet. I didn't forget. It's tight back there. I couldn't put it where I usually do. Oh, I see. So you were just going to leave it there so we could all trip over it. That's not very smart. I'm aware of the problem, and I'm working on it, okay? All right, make sure it's solved by the evening performance, okay, Jake? Okay. All right, if nobody else has anything, I'll see you all tonight in the green room. It was uncalled for Kate. If you had a beef, why didn't you just come to me? You were busy, Jake. Fixing your wife's all-important mark. You made me look bad. I don't like that. What are these files doing out? Your wife's with Betty. I think she's going to be there a while. Don't. Don't? That sure know what you said in Portland. Portland was a mistake. We've been through this, Kate. It's over. No, David. I'm afraid that it isn't. David is going to love 
It's oh, God, I'm good. Yeah, but can you do the rest of them by tonight? Pregnant? How the hell could you be pregnant? How the hell do you think? What are you going to do? That depends. On what? On what you're going to do. I know how badly you want kids. I'm married, Kate. You could always get a divorce. I don't want a divorce. Well, maybe Judy will. Look, don't you dare tell her. Don't you dare. You hear me? You tell anybody about this, and I'll make you sorrier than you've ever been in your life. You got that? You know what? I think maybe the best thing for me to do right now would be to take an extended leave of absence. You know, so I can make other arrangements. It's just the only problem is I, I, I just uh, can't afford it. How much? Why don't you and I give this some thought? And we'll talk later. After the show. All right? Oh, speaking of which. I really, really, really want to do that coffin routine from now on. Starting tonight. It is okay with you, isn't it? I'll tell Anne. Thanks. I mean, it is the very least you can do. Don't you think? So what are you doing after the show tonight? I've got plans. Well, what about tomorrow night? Oh, I don't know how to say this in a nice way. So I won't. I'm not interested. Not even interested in helping me spend a thousand bucks? Where did you get a thousand dollars? Come to dinner with me, maybe I'll tell you. No, thanks. Oh, come on. Why not? Because you're not my type. I'm not your type. No. I got news for you. Any man with a thousand bucks in his pocket is your type. Paul, do you know how much money you're going to have left tomorrow? Nothing. Do you know why? You're a loser. David? Hi, I got your message. What's up? Yeah, look, Ann, I'm, uh... I'm gonna let Kate do the coffin act. What, you mean she gets to do the finale? Yeah, in fact, I've decided to let her... let her do the act from now on. Why? Because I said so, that's why. Oh. Look, Ann... I'm sorry. David... <laughs> All you have to do is reach around with your right hand and pull. See? Betty, I can't find my wand. I wondered if you'd seen it anywhere. It's not back here. Sorry. Oh, did the front of the house get a hold of you? No. What did they want? Your guests are here. Guests? Oh, damn. I forgot all about them. Have you seen Judy anywhere? I haven't seen her. Would you find her, please? Tell her to meet me in the VIP suite. Tell her Perry Mason's here. Yeah. Well, I think you'd better get them to their seats. Curtain's in 15 minutes. I'm sure David will want to see them after the show. So how long you known him? Three years. He performed to the benefit I helped organize to raise money for those kids. He wasn't famous then, but he certainly is now. Oh, but he still does the benefit every year. That's the only time we get to see him and Judy. Harry, good to see you again. Great to see you, David. How are you, Della? Fine, David. Oh, David. <laughs> My uh, associate, Ken Melansky. Pleasure Ken. to meet you. Likewise. Harry's told me a lot about you. Glad you all could make it. I'm glad you gave Perry the comp tickets. My pleasure. Nice watch. Oh. 
Nice hands. Oh. <laughs> Perry, what's this I hear about the benefit falling short of its goal this year? Ah, uh, recessions tend to be hard on charity events. Do you think you'd meet your goal if I donated all the proceeds from tonight's performance? I'm sure we would. Then that's exactly what I'm going to do. Thank you very much. Judy and I have wanted to do this for a long time. Since we don't have any of our own. Judy. Where is Judy? I don't know. You know, I, I don't believe I, I told her you'd be here. Maybe we can all get together after the show. Yeah. Sure. David, are you all right? Oh, I'm fine. No, actually, that's a lie. I've misplaced my wand, my, my lucky wand. It's like, it's like a rabbit's foot, and I use it whenever I perform. Oh, that's like the handkerchief that Perry puts in his inside pocket when he's trying a case. <laughs> you have a lucky handkerchief? Uh-huh. Della is having a pipe dream. Oh. <laughs> well, anyway, I know it sounds ridiculous, but I'm not going to be able to relax until I find the damn thing, so if you'll excuse me. We'll catch up with you after the show. Come backstage. I'll leave word with security. Good luck. He was upset because he lost his lucky wand? Well, it isn't just a wand. It's a coping mechanism. Uh, it's his way of dealing with stage fright. Where'd you learn so much about psychology? <laughs> From a man with his uh, lucky handkerchief. Big pipe dream. <laughs> oh, Perry. Max, what are you doing here? Well, what do you think I'm doing here, huh? You finally got my message and you came to see the show. Well, I wanted to see whether it was true. If what was true? That you've been stealing from me. Stealing from you? Who told you that? Before it gets around, kid. You were the best student I ever had, David. How could you... T How could you do this to me? Max, I assure you, I built every act in this show from the ground up. They may be based on principles you taught me, but I certainly didn't steal from you. If you don't mind, I'd just as soon see for myself. Huh? Go ahead. Ten minutes to curtain up, people. Where have you been? I've been looking all over for you. I've uh, been around. Perry's here. What's wrong? Nothing. Nothing's wrong. Now as we near the end up here on stage, it's time to consider death. Not on Earth, but up there. Death in the bleak emptiness of infinite space, the final frontier. If you were a pioneer in the frontier days of the Old West, you'd be buried out on the lone prairie. If you were a sailor, you'd be buried at sea. But what do you do if you die? Up there. What's to be done with the dead? In space, I'll show you what I do. First, I would get a coffin, not just any coffin, one suitable for eternal slumber in infinity itself. But what's a coffin without a body? Yours will do nicely. coffin and a body. Now all we need is some light and a little magic. A final farewell. A coffin and a body floating in space, surrounded by the dark mysteries of the universe, light years above the earth, until finally Somebody call an ambulance. All right, wow. So, what do we have here? 
accident, Lieutenant. Well, we'll see, Counselor. We'll see. This is the gentleman. Sir, are you up to answering some questions? I think so. Mm-hmm. Okay, by you, Counselor. Depends on the question. Well, for starters, what was supposed to happen when this, this coffin opened up? Nothing. Nothing. It should have been empty, and Kate shouldn't have been anywhere near it. Well, where, where, where should Kate have been? In the wings, making her way out front for her reappearance. Uh, well, why don't you just run the whole thing down to me? You mean, tell you how it's done? Tell me how it's done. Sooner or later, David. What the audience doesn't see when the coffin is wheeled out on stage is this. One of my assistants gets in, I close the lid. She rolls through this flap into a secret compartment while my wife attaches a wire. You don't see her do that because her black outfit blends right into the black backdrop. And then I create a few visual and verbal distractions while my assistant rolls out of the compartment and slips through the curtain. And then as the coffin magically rises into the air, she makes her way to the wings and ultimately reappears in the audience. But we could see her in the coffin when it was going up. What you saw was a projection and a precisely synchronized pre-taped image, a movie, if you will, is projected onto the side of the coffin as it rises. You remember that little wave of farewell she gave? That's on tape, too. So the question is, why didn't Mrs. Ford get out of the coffin and into the compartment like she was supposed to? <laughs> well, Mr. Mason, because this flap wouldn't open, that's why. Uh, Bob. Bob, is this what you saw? Yes, sir. Uh, you see, this wand was jamming it shut. And once Miss Ford uh, got in this coffin, she was trapped. There was no place else for her to go but down. Now, the question is, does anybody have any idea who this belongs to? It's mine. I searched for it right up until curtain. And I grabbed a spare and I went on. But you usually kept the wand in your dressing room. I have no idea how it got into that coffin, I swear. God, this is awful. David, unless the DA can come up with some reason that you wanted Kate Ford dead, I seriously doubt you'll be arrested, so take it easy. Will they do an autopsy? Yeah. Standard procedure in cases of sudden or unusual death. Why? She was pregnant. She told me tonight before the show. Perry, I slept with her once. Just once. I'd had too much to drink. Not that that's any excuse. Who else might have been aware of all this? I don't know. She wanted money. Did you give her money? We were going to talk about it after the show. Your knock on the door was deafening. Mr. Katz, I'm afraid I'm going to have to place you under arrest now. What's the charge? First degree murder. Premeditation? We can prove premeditation. It seems there were two people standing outside Mr. Katz's dressing room door when Miss Ford hit him with the news she was pregnant. One was your wife, sir? Judy. And the other was the wardrobe lady? Miss Betty Farmer. And Miss Farmer's the one who told us everything. What do you mean, everything? Well, Mr. Mason, not only was your client very upset when Miss Ford hit him with the news, she was carrying his child. He also threatened her. I didn't threaten her. According to Miss Farmer, you did exactly that. And that, sir, is the stuff murder indictments are made of. Can you comment on the fact that you uh, My client has nothing to say. I have no comment. What do you mean somebody was taping the show? I recall seeing a young woman with a video camera six seats to my right. But it's not allowed. We say so at the beginning of every performance. David, 
I'm sure that rule's broken many times. Hey, you should be grateful. That tape could come in very handy. If we can find it. Huh. Was the last night's show a sellout? They all are, or were. Well, since all the seats around us were reserved, it should be pretty easy to track down the people that were sitting there. An absolute, if I ever heard one. I'll get right on it. I'll get right on it, too. <clears throat> David, does everyone involved in this show know how the coffin trick works? I don't hire anyone unless they sign a document prohibiting them from divulging my secrets. Then any one of them could have sabotaged that trick. I guess so, yeah. Our first order of business, who on the show might have wanted Kate Ford dead? Wait a minute. The file. File? What file? The one I keep the design for the glass coffin in. I think someone may have rummaged through it while I was in the shower yesterday. Of course, you have no idea who. I have no idea who. Perry, I, uh, I haven't talked to Judy since I was arrested. Is it okay if I call her? Sure, right there. She must be very angry with me. Room 519, please. My name's Mason. I'm David Katz's attorney. I'd like to ask you a few questions. Sure. Um, come on in. Excuse the mess. I just took some things to the laundromat. How's David? Oh, he's doing fine. David tells me that he hired you and your husband about six months ago. Yes, that's right. Did you know Kate Ford very well? No, uh, I hardly knew her at all. But you worked right alongside her for six months, didn't you? Yes, I did. Let's just say I didn't really want to know her. I, um, I don't think she was the world's nicest person, if you know what I mean. Anne, I'm all out of socks. Jake, this is David's lawyer, Mr. Mason, my husband, Jake Morrison. How do you do? Uh, what do you want with that? Just asking some general background questions. I understand you're the one who wheels the coffin out on the stage each performance. That's right. Did you happen to notice anyone standing around by the coffin before you wheeled it out last night? Madhouse backstage during a performance. Nobody but nobody ever stands around. Especially Jake. Mr. Morrison, how did you get along with Kate? I didn't. As far as I could tell, neither did anybody else. She had a real problem with her attitude. I'm told you used to have a somewhat similar problem. Yeah, I got mad easy, that's all. Broke a man's legs during a barroom brawl. Did time in prison for it. I'd do it again, too. Really? Why? It was about my daughter, and it's none of your business. You're right. But if it does become my business, I'll be in touch. My name's Ken Molansky. I work with Perry Mason. Perry Mason, the attorney? Yeah. I'm his secretary. Mr. Wiener's not available. Is there anything I can do for you? A beautiful young woman taped David Katz's show a couple nights ago. So? That wouldn't happen to be you, would it? Why do you want to know? Mr. Mason's interested in taking a look at that tape. That's all. I don't know if Mr. Wheaton would want me to discuss this. Look, I'll leave him a message along with your card, and when he gets back from wherever he is, he'll call you, okay? Great. Thanks. No problem.
Yeah, I expect him in sometime this afternoon, but you know, you know. Excuse me. Lunches can get <laughs> Excuse me. Just a second. Yeah. Yeah, I was supposed to have lunch with Terry Weedner, but I forgot the name of the restaurant. Well, she usually has something. Going she? In. If you hurry, you can catch her. She just went out the front door. Yeah, I'm back. I don't understand why you're so worried. Harry Mason is a major league lawyer who only gets involved in murder cases, that's why. The tape you made for me has nothing to do with anyone's murder. What does it have to do with? I can't tell you. I don't like being caught in the middle like this. Look, you're not in the middle of anything, I can assure you. Now, you've done excellent work, you've been very well paid, and should I require your services in the future, I will be sure to contact you. Hmm? All of which is to say, goodbye. stands out like, well, a bright red car, Miss Wiener. I suppose this piece of junk is your car. Yeah, well, you didn't see me following you, did you? And it wouldn't hurt to dress a lot less flamboyantly, either. Look, would you stop patronizing me? I get enough of that for my clients. Like Max Lamar in there? Checked him out while you were inside. A piece of junk's got a phone in it. He's a magician, David Katz's mentor. He's probably the one you made the videotape of the show for, isn't he? Maybe. Why do you want a tape of the show? Why does Perry Mason want a tape of the show? Because it could help him prove that David Katz is innocent. Now you answer my question. <sighs> Lamar wouldn't tell me. However, I have a proposition for you. You see, believe it or not, business hasn't been going all that well for me lately. Well, try firing that part-time secretary of yours. She lies. <laughs> what I need is credibility. And I figure the best way to get it is by working for somebody famous, like your boss, for instance. <laughs> now, why should he hire you? Because of what I can offer. What's that? A duplicate of that tape. A coffin and a body floating in space. We're looking for something it's out of the ordinary. Is everything exactly as it should be? So far. That's all there is. When I saw her fall, I dropped the camera. You noticed nothing, David? Nothing, I'm sorry. Well, it was worth a try. Why did Max Lamar want a tape of David's show? I'm afraid that's privileged information, Mr. Mason. Lamar wouldn't tell her. That too. Terry, we really want to thank you. Here you go. Oh, I don't want a check. I want a job. We had a deal. You promised me. Now, wait a minute. I promised you'd be paid. I never promised you a job. Well, let's just call it even. Nothing for nothing. <clears throat> she misunderstood. David, uh, take a look at this. Who's Greta Eisman? Kate Ford. Greta Eisman's her real name. She changed it eight years ago. You didn't know that? No. She ever talk about her past? I think she once told me she was from... Kansas, Wichita, I think. No, she was born right here in Colorado, a little town called Hastings. Why would she lie like that? Oh, it could very well have something to do with her murder. Ken, a fact-finding mission. Hastings, Colorado. Hastings, Colorado. 
David tells me you moved out, but you won't see him. I don't know what to say. Well, we had quite a talk. David told me I know you can't have children. I also know from your involvement in the benefit each year how much you love them. Hearing that Kate was pregnant must have been a horrible blow. I couldn't believe it, Perry. That woman pregnant with David's child. Just like that. He and I had been trying for years. It seems so unfair. The police questioned you after her death. You didn't tell them what you'd overheard. Why not? I don't know. It could be construed that you were trying to hide the fact that you had a motive for killing Kate. I never thought of that. Killing myself, yes, but Kate. I was uh, trying to protect David. I still love him. Judy, talk to him. Give him a chance to explain. He made a mistake, a big one. He misses you. When will Mr. Eisman be back? All right. Thanks anyway. Excuse me. Excuse me. My name's Ken Molansky. I'm an attorney. I'm working on a murder case down in Denver. How can I help you? Well, I'm looking for information on Greta Eisman. Greta Eisman from Hastings? Yeah, she moved away about eight years ago. I'm sorry. You've got the wrong town. All right, great. Thanks. I haven't had the pleasure of meeting all of you yet. I'm Perry Mason, David's attorney. I'd like you to watch a tape that was made the night Kate Ford was killed. As members of the cast and crew, you might see something in it that will jog your memory and shed some light on what happened that night. Can everyone see? Yeah. 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 Sure. Ms. Morrison, would you like to move closer? Oh, no, thank you. I, I'm fine. I, I have 20-20 vision. I'm okay. Now, as we near the end up here on stage, it's time to consider death, not on Earth. First, I would get a coffin. Not just any coffin. One suitable for eternal slumber in infinity itself. But what's a coffin without a body? Yours will do nicely. Now all we need is some light and a little magic. A final farewell. A coffin and a body floating in space, surrounded by the dark mysteries of the universe, like years above the Earth, until finally, Did you notice anything that might be of significance? Anything at all? Well, thank you anyway. I appreciate your coming down. That's all. That was very clever. What was? 
Well, we watched the tape while you watched us. If you'll excuse the expression, I don't miss a trick. Then perhaps you'll tell me who killed Kate Ford. I guess it was your client. Um, I'm sorry, but if you had heard what I heard, you'd think so too. Not that I blame him at all. I understand your younger sister used to be with the show. Anita was one of David's assistants. Why? I hear Kate was instrumental in getting her fired. And that you were very angry with her and David about that. But not angry enough to kill her. If that's what you're getting at. Maybe you didn't mean to kill her. Maybe you just wanted to make sure that she or David never performed again. I'm looking for information on Greta Eisman. Who? Oh? Greta Eisman? Born here, moved away about eight years ago? Never heard of her, and I've lived here all my life. Well, I figure she's related to the Henry Eisman that owns that sawmill on the way into town. Only Eisman in the book. Can't seem to get in touch with him, though. Mr. Eisman doesn't have any relatives. He used to have a daughter. He did? Got herself into trouble. Ah, don't pay any attention to him. Been drunk for five years straight. Half the time he doesn't know where he is. Come on, Casey, drink up and quit bothering my customers. What kind of trouble, Casey? Maybe I better tell you about this outside. Come on. Oh, Lynn, Harvey, get him out of here, would you? We got him. Oh, come on. Just leave those boys alone. I just said Eisman had a daughter. Stick around long enough, he'll tell you about the time little green men took him for a ride in their spaceship. Went to one of the moons of Jupiter. <laughs> I don't know what you're talking about. Didn't you have Terry Wiedner make a tape of David's show the night Kate Ford was murdered? No. Of course not. I understand much, if not most, of what David knows about magic came from you. Well, that is to be expected. I am the best. Or you were the best. These days, most people would say, David is the best. That does not mean it is true. But... David's popularity has certainly grown, hasn't it? It now overshadows yours, doesn't it? Isn't that why you went through his files and had Terry make that tape? Not to see if he was stealing from you, but to see if you could steal from him. That's outrageous. Mr. Lamar, when you saw the plans to that coffin, did you memorize them? Or did you put them to immediate use? Are you suggesting that I had something to do with that poor girl's death? Let's say David wouldn't be a threat to you anymore if he were in prison. And you, you'd have your revenge. Get out. Or you'll make me disappear? Just leave. Please give Mr. Torrance my regards.
tomorrow morning, you pack up and move on. Yeah? This doesn't concern you, lady. Me. After I stormed out of Mr. Mason's office, I listened in at the door. You what? I listened in at the door. And when I heard where you were going, I rented the dullest car they had, got the dullest clothes I could find, drove straight here, rented a room right down the hall, and beat you by 15 minutes. Well, I suppose I should be grateful. So, why do you think everybody in town has a thing about Greta Eisman? I said I was grateful, not that I needed a partner. I know where those Goonie brothers took that old drunk. Where? Give me some incentive and I might tell you. All right, you're in. It's not good enough. This time, I want to hear it from Perry Mason himself. Somebody broke into David's dressing room down at the theater tonight. Oh, yeah? I know who it was. As you know, David has all his employees sign an agreement stating they can be sued if they divulge any of his secrets. Apparently, the thief took only the one you had signed. No kidding. You're on Max Lamar's payroll, aren't you? Or at least you were on the night Kate Ford was murdered. No. That's where you got the roll of bills you kept flashing that night. Why you were at Lamar's house earlier today. Why you were at the theater tonight, stealing that agreement. I don't know what you're talking about. No? Lamar was paying you to pass on David's secrets. You were afraid that would come out during the trial. 
You destroyed your agreement with David so he couldn't sue you. Prove it. Oh, I will, Mr. Torrance. I will. And much more. What do you mean? Sit down. It's a well-known fact that you made frequent passes at Cape Ford. Passes that were rejected, always rejected. So? So a man can only take so much rejection, right, Mr. Torrance? Oh, wait a minute here. Max Lamar wanted to avenge himself on David. You wanted to avenge yourself on Kate. You knew how the coffin trick worked. It was perfect, a perfect arrangement, wasn't it? I didn't kill her, I swear it. I, I, I was mad at her, okay? But I didn't kill her. You gotta believe me. Do something for me, Mr. Torrance. You name it, you got it. How would you like to be a witness for the defense? When I saw that you weren't going to see where they took Casey, I decided I might as well. All right. So you're good. Mm -hmm. So how come you're a PI? How come you're a lawyer? Come on, male lawyers are a dime a dozen. Female PIs aren't. Well, maybe we should be. Why is that? Let's face it. PIs spend 99.9% .9 of their time looking for people and or things, right? Well, I'll buy that. Well, women are better at finding things than men are. That I don't buy. <laughs> Come on. I can still hear my father calling out, Honey, have you seen my wallet? Or, or where did I put my keys? Or, or where's the remote control? That sound familiar? So where is this place? It's, it's up ahead on the left. Solid. You get the idea. I think so. Morning, Della. Do you realize we're due in court in 45 minutes? We're on our way. Oh, Perry. Della, I want you to check with every optometrist in town. See if someone connected with David's show ordered a pair of contact lenses on the day of his final performance. Every optometrist. Do you realize how many there are in a city this size? Rock's a skunk. Looks like somebody wanted to make sure he stayed that way. See anything around here that looks like coffee? I don't see anything around here that looks like food, unless you count these cockroaches. Well, looks like we're going to be here for a while. I'm going to stash the truck. Good idea. Stands out like a sore thumb.
I will prove that David Katz, with malice aforethought, killed Kate Ford. I will prove that, although he is a married man, he not only had an affair with the victim, he impregnated her. I will prove that when she told him her sordid secret, he threatened her life. And I will prove that as soon as the opportunity presented itself, he caused Kate Ford to die a horrible death, hoping it would be construed as nothing more than a tragic accident. I will prove to you, ladies and gentlemen, that while David Katz may be a world-famous illusionist, he is also a cold-blooded murderer. An illusionist is one who performs illusions. I'm glad Mr. Willard brought that up, because this case turns on illusions, and you'd be well advised to keep that in mind. What's an illusion? Something which appears to be one thing, but is actually something else. In fact, Mr. Willard is something of an illusionist. He's going to attempt to show that my client is guilty when, in fact, my client is innocent. He's going to try to make you believe one thing when just the opposite is true. <coughs> Excuse me. Training, ladies and gentlemen. Anyone can perform an illusion. The fact that a woman is dead is no illusion. But the idea that David Katz is somehow responsible for that death is wrong and is an illusion. I'm going to prove that to you. Continue, Mr. Mason. Well, Your Honor, Kate Ford was killed during a very elaborate theatrical production choreographed to conceal as much as reveal. Because of time and space, it is critical to the defense and to presentation of evidence to the jury that our witnesses testify at the actual scene of this crime. I ask the court to reconvene in the theater where Kate Ford was murdered. Mr. Willard? Sounded ridiculous to me, Your Honor. But I'll try this case wherever this court wishes to send me. Well, this is the most unusual venue request I've ever experienced, but you know I believe in a fair and speedy trial for both the defendant and the prosecution. So I'll grant this motion. And we'll reconvene at the Paramount Theater at uh, 11 o'clock. Try walking in faster. I am walking in faster. This is just not working. Well, it's great to piss a bird. It's a miracle he didn't die. Oh. And the way he smells, I'm not so sure he didn't. Uh, and look, he's coming too. Here, get this Casey. Oh. Casey. Come on, Casey. Wake up. Huh? Casey. Huh? What? You okay? Who are you? My name's Ken Molansky. We met at the Gold Coin Saloon. You were telling me about Greta Heisman, remember? No. I might have had a drink, though. Here you go. Looks like coffee. It is coffee. What do you want in it? A double shot of bourbon. Nice. Milk. You need protein. Uh, well, who died and made you two God? We just want to know about Greta Eisman. You were telling me she got into some kind of trouble. She ran over a lady with a car and killed her. Hit and run. Was she caught? Her daddy owns a big sawmill. Mm. When he says jump, people in Hastings ask how high. Mm. When he says don't say nothing, people don't say nothing. 
You made sure she was never prosecuted? The police never even asked her any questions. She left town a couple of weeks later and never came back. And people are still protecting her? Her daddy still owns the sawmill. It's about the only thing keeping this town alive. What was the name of the woman she killed? You remember? I don't even remember your name, and you just told me a couple of minutes ago. It was in the paper, I bet. Hastings does have a newspaper, doesn't it? Mm-hmm. The weekly register call. I know, I sleep under it all the time. Where are we going? We're going to go outside. You need to air out. No, I don't. And we need to get out. Yo, Casey. Doesn't look like he's in there. Here's a hundred bucks. Hide them somewhere in town. Meet me at the newspaper office. I'm out of here. When the secret compartment was examined, this wand was uh, found. It was jammed up against the flap between the compartment and the coffin in such a way that the uh, flap couldn't open. You mean the victim was supposed to roll into the secret compartment before the coffin was lifted into the air, only because of this wand, she couldn't? That is correct. Could this wand have gotten jammed in there by accident? Objection. Well... Lack of foundation, improper opinion. Withdraw the question. Lieutenant, were you able to disengage the wand easily? Objection. Relevancy. Overruled. You may answer, Lieutenant. No. Somebody or something had jammed it up against that flap. Thank you. Nothing further. Thank you. Lieutenant, didn't your investigation disclose that it was well known among the performers and stage crew that Mr. Katz kept this wand in his dressing room? Yes, almost everyone knew that, Mr. Mason. And before the performance, that glass coffin was kept on the stage inaccessible to any performers or stagehands. Apparently so. And you were not able to find anyone who saw Mr. Katz jam this wand into the flap of that coffin, were you? No, Mr. Mason. Thank you, but... Lieutenant. That's all. So you could hear them talking, even though the door was shut? Yes. 
Their voices were quite loud. They were both very upset. What exactly did the defendant say to Miss Ford? I can't remember his exact words, but I think he said something like, um, if you tell anybody about this, I'm going to make you very sorry. That's all? It wasn't just what he said. It was how he said it. His, his voice was, it was just so full of hate, it scared me. So he told Miss Ford he would make her very sorry. And six hours later, she was dead. Thank you. <clears throat> Ms. Farmer, after David Katz fired your sister last year, you had a confrontation with him, did you not? I may have. In fact, you said something like, I'm going to pay you back for this, did you not? Oh, I don't remember. Several people were present when you said that, were they not? If I said that, it was because I was angry. You were angry with him and you threatened him, did you not? It wasn't a threat. Oh? Why not? Because I didn't actually mean it. How do you know David Katz actually meant what he said to Kate Ford that night? I suppose I don't. In point of fact, you left before their conversation ended that night, did you not? Yes. I have nothing further. This court will reconvene at 2 o'clock. How many performances were there on the day in which Kate Ford was killed? Two, a matinee and an evening performance. So the glass coffin illusion was performed earlier that day as well as that night? Yes. Hmm. Who got into the coffin for the matinee? Miss Ford? No, I did. In fact, up until that evening, I always did the coffin trick. I could get out of the compartment the fastest. Why did you decide to let Miss Ford do it that night? I didn't. David did. He asked me to come to his dressing room after the matinee, and he told me that he had decided to let Kate do the finale that night. Did he say why? No. Had anything like this ever happened before? No, never. You mean, for the first and only time, David Katz arranged it 
so that Kate Ford got into that coffin that night instead of you? Yes. Thank you. Mr. Mason, wish to cross? I reserve the right to recall the witness and request a 10-minute recess to confer with my client, Your Honor. Very well. Ten minutes. Judy's not being here has me really upset, Perry. I'm sorry. I meant to tell you, but I forgot. It just slipped my mind, Perry. You've got to, you've got to believe me. David, even if it hadn't slipped your mind, we have no rebuttal. The prosecution just established premeditation. But Kate forced me to make the switch. But I have no way of proving it. Nobody's supposed to give the time of day to. Is he in town? I bought this paper about two years ago. First thing they tell you is don't cross the old man. Cosgrove, Terry Wheaton. Pleasure. Hi. On the other hand, it doesn't pay to ignore a good story. That's why I'm in the newspaper business. His daughter was just murdered. He had a daughter? Yeah, she changed her name to Kate Ford, moved away about eight years ago after being involved in a hit and run accident that left the woman dead. No kidding. That accident may have something to do with her murder. I figured you might have something in your files. They're back here. Help yourself. The filing system here isn't exactly state of the art. It's more like state of the dump. Do you have any coffee? I'd love some. Mr. Katz, would you please tell the court why you had Kate Ford do the coffin illusion instead of Ann Morrison? Kate told me she wanted to do it. Why would she do that? It was the only time during the show any of the women would get to have a featured role. And why did you give in to her? If I hadn't, she would have told my wife about our relationship. So, she blackmailed you into letting her do the coffin routine? Yes. When did she do this blackmail? At the beginning or end of your conversation? as she was leaving. Which would explain why Ms. Farmer failed to overhear it. Mr. Katz, did you cause Kate Ford to fall to her death by sabotaging that coffin? No, absolutely not. David, do you still love your wife? I could never love anyone else. That's all. Care to cross, Mr. Whelan? Um, just one or two questions, Your Honor. To your knowledge, no one ever heard Kate Ford ask to be put into the coffin, did they? No, apparently not. So, uh, all we have is your word? Yes. Is that your favorite wand, Mr. Katz? Your, uh... Lucky wand? Yes, it is. You claim to have misplaced your uh, lucky wand and that you did not sabotage this coffin in order to cause Kate Ford's death. Is that right? That's correct. So, all we have is your word. Yes. When you married your current wife, did you vow to love, honor, and cherish her? Yes, I did. Forsaking all others? Yes. You gave her your word, too, didn't you? Yes, I did, and I broke it. And I only hope that she can forgive me. Well, that's a very nice touch, Mr. Katz. You're a very able performer. Objection. Mr. Willard's not asking questions. He's apparently commencing his final argument. Sustained. You did know that Kate Ford was pregnant, didn't you? with your child? She said she was. Did you believe her? 
I knew it was possible. And you were afraid that public knowledge of your affair would ruin your marriage and might even affect your career, weren't you? Yes, I was. But... So you sabotaged that coffin. You put Kate Ford into it and you nearly made it appear as an accident, didn't you? No, I did not. I've sworn to tell the truth, and I am telling the truth. Nothing further. Redirect, Mr. Mason. One last question. I've asked it before, but I'll rephrase it. Mr. Katz, did you kill Kate Ford? No, sir. I did not. Mr. Willard? Nothing, Your Honor. Witness may step down. Next witness, Mr. Mason. Defense calls Paul Torrance to the stand. How long have you been with David's company, Mr. Torrance? Two years. In what capacity? As lighting director. And what is a lighting director? Well, basically, uh, I make sure what people are supposed to see is lit and what people aren't supposed to see isn't. Did you know Kate Ford? Sure. How well did she get along with the other members of the company? I wouldn't say she got along well with anybody. She didn't have a lot of friends? As far as I know, she didn't have any. Objection. Whether the victim was or wasn't popular with her peers has no bearing on this case. Mr. Willard would have this court believe that my client is the only person who had a motive for killing Kate Ford. I'm attempting to show otherwise, Your Honor. I'll allow this line of questioning. Proceed, Mr. Mason. What was Miss Ford like? Selfish, vindictive, mean, stuck up. All of those things, yet you asked her out. She was also great looking. Uh -huh. As a lighting director, do you stay in one spot during a performance or do you move around? I move around. Where are you during the glass coffin illusion? Uh, up on the catwalk. That one right up there. I was uh, doing the uh, projector. So when the coffin is lifted into the air above the stage, you're not that far from it. Is that correct? Right. Why didn't you do anything when you heard her scream? Heard who scream? Miss Ford. She didn't scream. But she was trapped. Are you saying she didn't cry out or pound on the sides of the coffin? That she just lay there waiting to fall to her death? Look, all I know is I didn't hear or see anything. Mr. Torrance, doesn't make much sense, does it? Thank you, that's all. Mr. Willard? No questions. A witness may step down. This court is adjourned till 9 a.m. tomorrow morning. Harry. Here's the information on the contact lenses. Huh. How many optometrists did I say there were? 257. Oh, you did a great job. There were 258. Yes! 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 I found it. Oh, wow. Hit and run accident, Queen's life. Why don't you get the truck? I'll meet you out front, okay? Oh, no way. No way. I am not driving back to Denver in a truck with a broken window. It's the dead of winter. Are you kidding? I'm getting my rental. Wait a sec, but I love my truck. It's a beautiful truck, Ken, but I'm getting my rental. Can I get a copy of this? Sure. So you found what you wanted? Yeah, that was great. Thanks a lot. Come on. Harvey, he's over here. Hold it right there. You really don't want to do that. You sure don't, son. Let me guess. You're a father, right? 
My daughter is dead. The man who killed her is about to be punished. That's all that matters. The man on trial is innocent. I'm trying to find out who did kill her. Don't you want to know the truth? I want my daughter to rest in peace. No, you don't. You just don't want people to know what she did here. That's all you care about. Take care of this for me, will you, boys? Move it out, pal. Now. Get in! Hey, get out! Get in! Nice driving. I know. Oh, really? That was great timing. I know. <laughs> Mason. Perry, I just got back. I have all your messages. Judy, we've been worried to death. Where the hell have you been? I spent the day with the children, and tonight I just uh, spent the time driving around till I could figure things out. David's beside himself. You know, it's a good thing you weren't needed in court today. Now, I know you and David have your differences, but you have to be in court in the morning. You have to be. Perry, I'll be there. I promise I'll be there. I'm sorry, Judy. It's... It's just that we all love you. I know. Thank you, Perry. Good night. Evidently, Kate... Or Greta back then just hit that woman and kept driving right on down the road without even slowing down. But none of the witnesses could identify her as the driver. Oh, they could, but they just didn't want to. It says here the victim was from Cheyenne, Wyoming. She and her daughter were on their way to visit friends in Gunnison. Well, this tells us who killed Kate Ford. Now the question is, can you prove it? Let's try this. And a little magic. A final farewell. A coffin and a body floating in space. Surrounded by the dark mysteries of the universe. Light years above the earth. As part of the demonstration discussed in chambers, my client will reenact the glass coffin illusion. Simultaneously, we will play what has been marked Defense Exhibit M, a videotape. The prosecution is stipulated to be an actual tape of the performance the night Kate Ford was killed. As I indicated in chambers, Your Honor, the state has continuing relevancy and foundation objections to this entire demonstration. Your objections are noted and overruled. Your Honor, in case we need someone to clarify these proceedings, defense recalls Mr. David Katz. Mr. Katz, you're still under oath. Yes, Your Honor. All right, places, everyone. Uh, with uh, Kate Ford dead, you're missing an assistant, are you not? That's correct. Ms. Farmer, would you be kind enough to stand in for Kate Ford? Good. Now we have six women. Go ahead, Mr. Katz. All right, Jake, let's take it from your entrance. Okay. First, I, First, would, get I would get a coffin. Not just any Not coffin. Not just any coffin, one suitable for eternal slumber in infinity itself. But what's a coffin without a body? Yours will do nicely. Yours will do nicely. A coffin. A coffin. And a body. And now, a body. All we need now all we need is some light. Some light. 
and a little magic. A final farewell. A coffin and a body floating in space, surrounded by the dark mysteries of the universe. Light years above the Earth until finally. Your Honor, I object. Lights, Mr. Torrance. Mr. Mason, that is something we did not discuss in chambers. I'm sorry to cause a commotion, Your Honor, but I assure you it was entirely germane to this demonstration. Then get on with it. So skilled is my client at making an audience look where he wants it to look that I doubt anyone in this room noticed that Mr. Melansky had stopped the tape. We stopped it because we'd like you, the jury, to compare the number of assistants you see on stage right now with the number you see on the tape. One, two, three, four, five. And one backstage, having slipped out of the coffin through the secret compartment before it began to rise. Five women on stage. Now look at the tape. One, two, three, four. Only four women on stage. Where's the other one, Mr. Katz? I don't know. There should be five women on stage. Were all six women always on stage at the same time during your show? No, in point of fact, this illusion was the only time they were all on stage together. Because it was the finale? Yes. Who's missing? Can you tell? Not from this distance. You mean, if they were close up, you could tell them apart? Sure. But in costume, they look exactly alike, don't they? To an audience, they are mirror images of each other. Yes, but not to me. How do you tell them apart? By their eyes. The shape, the color. Sandy's eyes are hazel. Jeanette's are gray. I know Anne's are blue. What about Kate Ford? Do you remember the color of her eyes? Brown. She had brown eyes. Your Honor, at this time, I'd like to recall Ann Morrison to the stand. You recently bought a pair of contact lenses, did you not? Yes. You picked them up on the same day you ordered them, rush job, no prescription involved. You wanted them for cosmetic reasons? Yes. To change the color of your eyes, is that correct? Yes. What color did you want your eyes to be? Brown. Same as Kate Ford's. Mrs. Morrison, how did your mother die? She was, um, went over by car. Who was driving that car? Um, I don't know. The police never caught anybody. It was a uh, hit and run. But you found out who it was, didn't you? Uh, Mr. Morrison, would you please step forward? Please uh, sit there, Mr. Morrison. Jake Morrison. Jake Morrison is your father, is he not? Not your husband, your father. He's your father. Wasn't your father, Jake Morrison, serving a sentence for assault at the time of the accident? Didn't that fact cause you to spend several years drifting in and out of foster homes? Didn't you and your father grow to hate the woman who destroyed your lives? And wasn't that woman Kate Ford? Don't look at your father, look at me. Didn't you find Kate Ford was working for David Katz? Didn't you pose as man and wife so Kate wouldn't know who you were when you finally got a job on David's show? Then you waited, didn't you? You waited. 
Kate Ford had gotten away with it when she killed your mother. You wanted to get away with it when you killed Kate Ford, isn't that so? No. When you heard Kate would do the coffin routine that night, you knew you had your chance. You and your father. Your father killed Kate with his bare hands. With his bare hands. He broke her neck. Then placed her body in the secret compartment and waited for his cue. When it came, he wheeled the coffin on stage as usual. David, fooled by the brown contact lenses you were wearing, put you into the coffin thinking you were Kate. He closed the lid. You rolled into the secret compartment, then shoved Kate's body into the coffin. The wand you'd stolen from David's dressing room, you used to jam the flap. You slipped out of the compartment, through the curtain, waited until all eyes were on the rising the coffin. The then you slipped back on stage. Ann Morrison. You thought everyone would assume that you were Kate Ford. You thought no one would ever suspect you of being an accomplice to murder. An accomplice to her murder. Leave her alone. She's been through enough. I'm the one who murdered Kate. Mason, you could move to dismiss. We move to dismiss, Your Honor. Mr. Willard? The uh, state has uh, no objection. This case is dismissed, and the jury is excused. Bailiffs, please take these two people into custody. You came. <laughs> so am I. <laughs> well, I still don't know how you did it. We magicians never reveal our secrets. <laughs> anyway, I'm very grateful. And I. Yes. Oh, oh, we'll be right there. Judy? In our long talk, David told me that your future included adopting two kids. But Judy, you were way ahead of us. You already had them picked out. Kevin, Sarah, you know Judy. I want you to meet someone who is going to love you just as much as she does. Kevin, Sarah, this is David. this morning yes ma'am wheat toast i was watching the weather report this morning it's gonna be a beautiful day miss draper beautiful day yes it certainly is
I'll just be a minute. Of course, these days no line would be complete without something for the working woman. Therefore, I created these. Very nice. I think we can do some business. Thank you. My things should do very well in your stores. Looks like what I've heard is true. What have you heard? That you're back from the dead. I prefer to think of it as having been on a creative sabbatical. Excuse me, Mr. Sabatini. Somebody's here to see you. Take a closer look. I'll be right back. Hello, Marco. A buyer? With any luck. What can I do for you? Let's talk. In private. Also, a microphone was pointed at you, Marco. Recorded every word you said. Do you want to hear the tape? No. Good. Because every time I hear it, I get very angry. What are you going to do? I am going to bury you two. You're going to print this? Next issue of Sweet 2000, editor's column. You can't do that. Why not? Give me one good reason why I shouldn't tell everybody what a sorry piece of scum you are. I'll pay you anything you want. I have connections you can't believe. Keep those. I have copies. Oh, by the way, Marco, your new line looks fabulous. Too bad no one's going to want to touch it after I get through with you. I have bad news. Desk. Everyone's in the conference room. Here's your coffee. Good. And Tanya Sloan is inside waiting for you. She's what? I'm sorry, Miss Draper. I couldn't stop her. Lacey. She just came bodging in, saying that she absolutely had to talk to you and that she'd do something horrible if any of us tried to make her leave. Oh. So, Tanya, what is this horrible thing you're threatening to do? A scene from that play you bombed in last year? That's not funny. Interesting, that's exactly what the critics said. In fact, dear, shouldn't you be at an acting class or something? For your information, I fly to Los Angeles tomorrow to meet with Kevin. He wants me to co-star in his next picture. So, go home and pack. Not until I know if it's true. If what is true? I heard you're going to write about me in your next column. Should I, Tanya? Have you been a naughty girl? I have worked too hard to get where I am. I am not going to let you ruin me. Tanya, two sayings come to mind. You made your bed, now lie in it. And, if you can't take the heat, get out of the kitchen. And I do mean, get out. And here's one for you, Diane. What goes around, comes around. Bimbo. shot these? Kim Weatherly. Oh, they're very good. Must be all that practice he got in Newark. Okay, go with these three. Okay? All right. Let's look at the layout. Come on, come on. All right. This is cluttered, juvenile, unacceptable. Do it over. Diane, we go to press tomorrow. Not with that layout, we don't. Look, if I'm gone by the time you finish, bring that over to my apartment tonight. And if it's still not right, your next assignment will be to clean out your desk. Got it? All right, Julia, what's next? Uh, pages 95 through 97 are oh, ads. Excuse ads. me. Mr. Aver, it's 1210 and you have a 1230 luncheon. <sighs> All right, everybody back here at 2.
Thank you, Gerard. Would you like a cocktail while you wait? Just the usual. Mineral water with a splash of lime juice. Very good. Seltzer with lime, table four. I'm sorry to keep you waiting. Your name? Mason. Perry Mason. Ah, it'll just be a moment, Mr. Mason. We're in luck. They're busy. That's good. Means they haven't changed chefs since the last time we were here. Uh. Lauren? Della Street, what a surprise. Been trying to reach you, Perry. You remember Lauren Jeffries? Well, of course. Nice to see you again. <laughs> what are you doing in New York? Perry's receiving an award from the American Bar Association. Congratulations. Della deserves it just as much as I do. I can believe oh. that. You know, I still think the woman behind the man story that we did on you is the best in the whole series. Oh. In fact, it's probably the best we've ever done, period. Come on. Listen, how is Metropolitan doing? Oh, it's doing great. It, the magazine practically runs itself these days. And then you could join us for lunch. Well, yes. actually, I have plans. I just dropped in here and have work, so. But I really do want to see you. How long are you going to be in town? Just till Friday. Well, call my office this afternoon. We'll figure out something, OK? Oh, wonderful. I'd love it. Mr. Mason, this way, please. I'll be right with you, sir. It's only common courtesy to return a phone call. We have a deadline. I was too busy. May I sit down? I am waiting for someone. Then I'll keep you company. Thank you, Gerard. Very interesting. Diane Draper chatting with Lauren. Should I know who Diane Draper is? Only if you read the fashion magazines. She runs a magazine, Sweet 2000. It's Metropolitan's biggest competition. Very tough lady. Uh, is she and Lauren competitors? More like uh, bitter rivals. Now, why in the hell would I want to waste my column on you? Because the way things are going, my magazine is going to overtake yours within a year, and you are desperate. Huh, you wish. Yeah, well, I know how you operate, Diane. I, I know how it turns you on to hurt people. All I do is sell magazines. Oh, yes. By digging through people's garbage and then tearing them to pieces in that column of yours every month. Look, all I do is tell it like it is. Not about me, you don't. What the hell is that? A threat? Warning. Have a nice day. Newark. Julie, what do, you, what do you mean she said something about Newark? She said something about you getting a lot of practice there. Did she say what she meant by that? No, it was not in her remark. She didn't mean anything by it. Is she in? No. Even if she was, she wouldn't want to talk to her. We publish tomorrow. Kim, these are great. I'll tell you what, as soon as Diane gets off the warpath, I'll pass them along, all right? You seen a column? For next month? No, she never writes until the very last minute. Who's she going after this time? Why do you ask? I got a feeling it's gonna be me. Oh, man, not you, too. I mean, every month it's the same thing. People who are just positive that Diane is gonna write something bad about them come crawling out of the woodwork begging her not to. I mean, half the time she's never even heard of them. Yeah, John's over. Come on, conference room. Let's go. Diane. Wait, wait, Kim, Kim, Kim. Uh, don't, all right? I'll talk to her. And if you come by my place for dinner tonight, I'll tell you what she said. Okay. Okay, it's 926 West 74th, apartment 219, let's say 730. Here are your messages. Who'd you like to call back first? Nobody. I'm going home and so are you. All right. See you in the morning. Good night, Lacey. Good night. Diane, can I talk to you? Tomorrow. I'm out of here. You written your column yet? That's why they invented home computers, Julia. Well, it's just that people have been bugging me all day about who you're going after this month. What are you telling them? That I don't know. <laughs> Good. And people will be surprised. Thank you.
Yeah, what? Uh, there's somebody here to see you. Uh, says her name is Lauren Jeffries. Send her up. You can go up. A pop in 4B. Thank you. Snow White herself. What a surprise. We're going to have this out, Diane, once and for all. Yeah, I love it. Paris my favorite city on Earth. It's a city of light. Hmm? No, hmm. maybe I think it's the city of food. Yeah. <laughs> no, no doubt they can see it. No, it's just a clock. Matt? I know. Hello? Yes, this is she. No, 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 that's no problem. Um, I'll be right there. I'm, I'm not too far. All right. All right, bye-bye. Julia, you're leaving. Yeah, look, I'm sorry, but uh, somebody was supposed to drop a layout off of Diane's tonight, but she's not answering the phone or the door. The security guard's worried something may have happened to her. Um, I'm really sorry. Just, um... I won't be long. So why don't you just wait here, all right? Diane? Diane, it's Julie. Are you there? Try to keep. It's really odd. She's such a nice behavior tonight. What happened to her? Oh, my God. Oh, my God. Hurry. She's dead. We don't want any. Lauren Jeffries called while we were at the banquet. She's been arrested. Coroner puts the time of death between 8 p.m. and 9 p.m. Not only did the security guard log Miss Jeffries into the building at 7.54, but the person living in the apartment next to the victim heard shouting and loud noises at around 8.20. That was five minutes before the security guard locked Miss Jeffries out of the building. But no one actually saw anything. We also found some of the victim's jewelry in the bottom drawer of Miss Jeffries' desk. Detective Brennan... Doesn't it seem a little strange to you that a woman who makes half a million dollars a year would stoop to robbery? Guess she was just in the mood. A floppy disk was stolen out of the victim's computer that night, too. Did you find that in Miss Jeffrey's desk? No. But the victim's secretary found what we're assuming was on that disk in the computer at the magazine the next morning. Apparently, Miss Draper had transmitted it via modem sometime before she was murdered. It was her column for the next editor's page, all about how Miss Jeffries had solicited bribes from fashion designers. She would give them favorable press, and they would give her money. Lauren Jeffries stole that disc and killed Diane Draper in an attempt to save her reputation. It's as simple as that. But this isn't true. None of this is true. But Diane was going to print it. I have never taken a bribe in my life. No one has ever paid for editorial space in my magazine. Why did you go to see her that night? For the same reason that I went to see her that day in the restaurant. I was number one on her hit list. She was determined to get me. I wanted to stop it. Because she was becoming a nuisance? She was calling people, trying to get dirt about me. That wasn't all. I knew that if Diane put her mind to it, she would eventually find some, some way to, to discredit me. I don't believe that. Well, we all have our secrets. Some we should know about? Yes. 
I have a daughter. I was 16. Back in Odessa, Texas in those days, when a girl got pregnant, she stayed pregnant. I, I wanted to give my baby up for adoption. But my boyfriend, Scott, wouldn't hear of it. So, two weeks after she was born, I, I left her at Scott's. I got on a bus to New York, and I never went back. You left your baby? I had to. I assumed that Scott's grandparents would take care of her. But I found out later that they made him do it all by himself. Instead of going to college, he got a job at a rendering plant. He worked there until he was 38, at which time he died of what amounted to alcoholism. There's no reason for all of this to come out in court. There's more. My daughter managed to get out of Odessa. She came to New York and got a job at Sweet 2000 as Diane Draper's assistant. Her name is Julia Collier. Does she know you're her mother? Of course. She wanted to work for Diane to spite me. Did Diane know? Oh, yes. She loved to rub my nose in the fact that my only daughter hated me every chance she got. But it isn't the kind of thing that she would have put in a column, if that's what you're getting at. Why not? Well, because it was common knowledge. I mean, people in our business already knew. If she put it in her column, it would have been a, an embarrassment, but that's about all. When you went to her apartment that night, did she tell you her column was going to be about you? I couldn't get her to talk about anything, so I left. You weren't the one who took that disc from her computer? And I wasn't the one who killed her. I swear. Well? Well, what? You still haven't told me if you've decided to take her case. Stella, there are thousands of very good attorneys in this city who would jump at the chance to defend a woman who is not only innocent, but who can pay their fee without blinking an eye. Mm -hmm. But uh, you have something that they don't. What is that? Secretary, who will find it very hard to forgive you if you turn this case down. Della. Perry, she needs you. Della. Oh, Perry. Call Ken. I already have. What's that? Here you are. Tanya Sloan. Mm -hmm. The actress? Rumor has it she's going to co-star in a very big motion picture. Ah. And that she had an argument with Diane Draper the day of the murder. And they were going to talk about the column that Diane was writing. Because she only went after the rich and famous, right? Miss Sloan certainly fits that profile. Here you are. Kim Weatherly. And Marco Sabatini. Weatherly's the hottest fashion photographer in New York right now, and Sabatini's a very successful clothes designer. Kim was overheard expressing concern that Diane's next column was going to be about him. And Sabatini? Diane's driver said she dropped in to see him at his showroom on her way to work the morning of the murder. But if her column was going to be about one of these three and not Lauren Jeffries? How do you explain the column that was on the computer at the magazine? I'd say the killer dictated a phony column to her and forced her to send it before he killed her. Maybe he wrote the column himself and sent it after he killed her. Check with the phone company. It wouldn't hurt to know the precise time that document was transmitted. But why your client? Why'd the killer frame her? Lauren had a confrontation with Diane in a restaurant. Later that day, that confrontation was common knowledge among the people in the fashion industry, plus the fact that she and Diane were long-standing business rivals. It all made her the perfect patsy. Well, I guess I'll start with Tanya Sloan. No. Start with Sabatini.
Tanya's in L.A., but she'll be back Friday. Yeah, I'm looking for Mr. Sabatini. Oh, he's not here. He's not? No, I took the day off. Well, how come I just saw him walk in here? You didn't. My name's Ken Molansky. I'm an attorney. I work with Perry Mason. You might have heard of him. He's representing the woman who's accused of killing Diane Draper. I'd like to talk to Mr. Sabatini. Well, when I see him, I'll tell him. Well, you must have a good memory. Like an elephant. Did Diane always write her column at home? Not always, no. But she did it often enough that sending it to the computer at the office was no problem. Well, yeah, she worked at home and modem stuff in all the time. In other words, anybody could have used this computer to modem something to the office. What are you getting at? I think Lauren Jeffries was framed. By whom? Tanya Sloan, Marco Sabatini, or Kim Weatherly? Do you know any of them? Well, yes, I know all of them. They all apparently thought Diane was going to write about them in her next column. Look, Mr. Mason, Kim was with me when this happened. From 7.30 right up until the time I came over and found the body, we were having dinner at my place. And Diane kept her jewelry here? As far as I know, yeah. Well, thank you, Julia. I've seen enough for now. I've been meaning to ask you something. Let me guess, does it have something to do with the fact that Lauren Jeffries is my mother? You didn't need me to let you in here. You could have gotten a key from the police. She thinks you hate her. I do. Why? Why? Have you ever heard her side of what happened all those years ago, Julia? No, I really don't want to hear it. You should hear it. Mr. Mason, she murdered Diane. It wouldn't hurt to hear her side of that story either. After you. Sabatini. You are Marco Sabatini, right? Sabatini took the day off. I just want to ask you a few questions. You have the wrong person. You're going to have to talk to me sooner or later. Maybe never, counselor. Sayonara. Yo, taxi! Hey! Mr. Mason! Mr. Mason, hi. I'm Peter Whalen, Assistant District Attorney. I'll be prosecuting the Jeffries case. And you must be Della Street. Hi, I'm Peter Whalen. Nice to meet you. Thank you. I can't tell you what an honor this is, sir. Mr. Mason, I think you're the greatest. I've studied every single one of your cases. Every case? You're one of my idols. I begged for this assignment. I'm, um, I'm flattered. I've never looked forward to anything so much in my life. Well... I'm looking forward to trying this case, too. No, no, Mr. Mason. I'm talking about beating you. (laughs) 
Your Honor, the defendant owns homes in London, Saint Tropez, New York, and Vail. Now she has bank accounts not only in those four cities, but in Bermuda and Switzerland as well. In other words, she could very easily flee this jurisdiction and take residence in any number of countries with no significant decline in her lifestyle whatsoever. In fact, Your Honor, the risk of flight is so great here that the state requests that bail be denied. Mr. Mason. Uh, Mr. Wyndham, if what mattered most to my client was being affluent and enjoying a certain lifestyle, Your Honor, she would have retired to any one of those geographical locations years ago. What matters most to her is her magazine. She created it, nurtured it, watched it grow and mature. It's what has kept her here all these years. And it's what will continue to keep her here long after these charges have proven false. I request that she be released on her own recognizance. The charge is murder, Mr. Mason. An OR release is out of the question. However, the court is not entirely unmoved by your eloquence. Bail is set at $250,000. Let's see, gentlemen, how does the 27th sound? Uh, that's fine, Your Honor. Prosecution concurs. Good. The court will adjourn for lunch. We will resume at 2 p.m. Thank God. I can't wait to get out of here. Lauren? I think that maybe it's time we talked. Oh. All right. Um, dinner tonight? All right, um, I'll call me when you get home. Can you believe that? Wonderful. Let's get out of here before she changes her mind. I'll see you at the hotel. I know you'd go with the, uh, her magazine as her life argument. But, frankly, I couldn't think of a way to deprive you of it. Well, I'm sure you'll do better next time, Mr. Whalen. You bet I will. Oh, I almost forgot. I have something for you. Preliminary list of the people I'm going to call as witnesses. You can't be serious. I'll see you here in court, Counselor. Now. I may have to remove myself from this case. Why? The argument we overheard in that restaurant. Whalen plans to call me as a witness. Lauren, you don't understand. I want you to be my lawyer, and that's that. There's a very good chance I'll be called to testify against you. I don't care. I'd be in the position of helping the prosecution convict you. How can you help convict me when I'm innocent? Lauren, it's not as simple as that. Look, if you're telling me they won't allow you to be my attorney, that's one thing. But if you were asking me if I still want you to be my lawyer, I think I've made myself more than clear. Come on, Della.
Okay, cut it, cut it. Terrific. You guys all right? Good, good. Tanya, you got about 20 minutes, okay? Good. All right, Gary, get Billy Ray down here. I want to hear, not on the phone. Miss Sloan? Very amazing. Ah, you made it. It's a lot of work for a commercial. Well, commercials these days are sometimes bigger than films. This one's for a new perfume called Purloin. I gather you have a few questions you'd like to ask me. Shall we talk in here? I understand you talked to Diane Draper the day she was murdered. Yes, I did. And that your conversation didn't last very long. No, didn't. May I ask what you talked about? I uh, heard that she was going to write about me in her column. Your drug problem? I do not have a drug problem. Diane thought you did. Yeah, well, she was wrong. Besides, she couldn't prove anything. Still, if there were a speculation about it... It could have ruined me. Look, I don't know why Diane had it in for me. Maybe she was jealous. <laughs> Who knows? Was she going to write about you in her column? Mr. Mason, at the time of the murder, I was at a play called Harley's House. It stank. But I told the writer I loved it because I was his guest and he still pulls some weight in Hollywood. Okay? Okay. Before today, I'd have thought it impossible for you to be in two places at once. But I can't say that anymore, can I? Hey, Marco's in? No, I haven't heard from him yet. Then who's that for? Somebody who's waiting for him, an old friend from out of town. A friend? Mm-hmm. Give me that. Okay, pal, take a hike. Until I talk to Sabatini. What for? You already been through his desk, haven't you? Now, what makes you think I'd do a thing like that? Get lost before I have you hold him for trespassing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'm I the am ammo. ammo. Right. Exactly. On Wednesday? Sounds wonderful. I think we can do that. Great. Thank you very much. Uh, he said I'd probably have better luck finding Marco at that place he usually hangs out at. Damn, I forgot the name already. Gabriella's? Gabriella's, yeah, that's it. Thanks a lot. You're welcome. suggested we go to dinner from here so I could see where you live. It's very nice. Oh, thank you. Of course, I've known for a long time where you live. I just never. Look, uh, maybe this is a bad idea. I don't know. You've got to let me explain. <laughs> you don't want to explain. No. You want to make excuses. I want to tell you what happened. No, I know what happened. You decided that you didn't want me. That's what happened. You didn't want me, so you just left me. I was 16 years old. I didn't know what I wanted. Well, all I know, lady, is that you didn't want me. You were better off without me. How, how dare you even say that to me? I mean, even kids whose mothers swore at them or hit them. I mean, I envied them. I mean, at least their mother hadn't taken one look at them and then just walked away. <laughs> Your father was ready for you, Julie. I just wasn't. I went away from you because I didn't know how else I was going to survive. I thought being with a father who was devoted to you would be enough. I didn't know how horribly it was going to hurt you. I'll tell you the truth. Even 
even if I had, I wouldn't have stayed. I couldn't. I'm sorry. So, uh, what do you propose we do now? I mean, are we supposed to start over? Is that it? Why don't we just start from here? I'll, um, I'll get my purse. Said you found Sabatini. Yeah, but look who he's with. How you doing, all right? Everybody all right, guys? I know. Mr. Mob himself. What should we do now? What you came to do? I mean, I started the day chasing a dressmaker. Wait, Perry, wait. Excuse me, Marco Sabatini? Who are you? My name's Mason. I represent the woman accused of murdering Diane Draper. I'd like to ask you a few questions. Albert Nardone, and I have heard of you. And I have you. I've heard you know more about criminal law than I do. <laughs> what kind of questions do you want to ask my cousin, Mr. Mason? Your cousin? But he's the son of my cousin, but it's family. That's the important thing. I don't care what kind of questions he has. If he wants to talk to me, he does in front of my lawyer. And since my lawyer's not here, neither am I. Uh, I'm afraid he's stubborn like his mother. Mr. Mason, join me. Uh, rain check. Sure. Uh, you getting to be a bad habit, you know that? License number. No, I didn't get the color of the car. Sabatini's bodyguard saw him. Who knows? He and Nardone split the minute the cops showed up. I think that's why Sabatini was afraid to talk to us. There's no guns involved. Possible. Well, that's it. That's it. about several thousand cars. Yeah, but the car we're looking for has a broken headlight. Whoever was driving it may have stolen. That's true. Not much of a lead, is it? You better tell the police and head back to the hotel. I want you to get a good night's sleep. Oh, uh, Ken. It's a lead. Hey, Lieutenant. Give you a lift? Oh, thanks, I can take a cab. <laughs> Come on, why pay for a cab when you can ride in this nice limo for free? Because I don't want to take a ride in a nice limo for free. I got something right here, says you do.
So I wanted to talk to her. So what? You also tried to call her that day four times. I repeat, so what? So what was that important? I just turned in some proof sheets. I want to know what she thought. It had nothing to do with those pictures you used to take in Newark? You lost me. Before you became a fashion photographer, you paid the bills by taking pictures for a businessman in Newark. A man who has since been jailed for the sale and distribution of pornography. Who told you that? It came from notes found in Diane Draper's office. If she'd put that in her column, it would have been disastrous for you, wouldn't it? People in this town tend to be very open-minded. Not your present publishers. Look, I don't even know why we're having this conversation. I was with somebody the night Diane was killed. I have an alibi. I was with a friend. Maybe you Maybe also have friends who would agree to do okay. you a favor. Okay. Here you go. I got him on the line. Hello, Mr. Mason. No. You're going to have to excuse me. Uh, when I went to pay for breakfast this morning, I discovered I was missing a credit card. Yeah, I'd like to report a missing card. This uh, business, a pleasure. Well, actually, it's a little bit of both. The magazine's doing the shoot, so I came over to supervise, and I really like to watch Kim work. Your dinner with your mother went well, I hear. Yes. Anyway. But we still have a long way to go. But you're talking. Yeah. Would you excuse me for a minute, please? right. Ken Molansky. Well, you, me, Tony over here, Mason, we all want the same thing. We do? Yeah, we do. Marco was my relative. Not a close relative, but a relative nonetheless. You want to know who killed him? I want to know who killed him. Well, if you want to know the truth, we sort of thought that you might have had him killed. <laughs> that goes to show you how much you know. Tell me something, Mr. Melansky. Uh, what do you think? The teal or the periwinkle? Excuse me? Which material? For the dress? Never mind, never mind. The teal. Teal. Two years ago, Marco came to me on his knees. He just learned uh, the hard way that he lacked the one thing it takes to be a good clothes designer. Talent. So I told him I'd give him enough money to get on his feet on one condition. That he let me design the dresses. He could have all the credit. He agreed, and the rest is history. You design dresses? I love doing this. I'm very good at it. But in my profession, one has to maintain a certain image, so I keep it a secret. Oh, yeah. But whoever killed Marco killed my partner, as well as my cousin, and I want to find out who that was. Marco killed Diane Draper? No, no, no. He said he didn't, and I have to assume he knew better than to lie to me. And what were you two talking about last night? Well, she knew something about him, something bad. And uh, he was worried that someone like Mason would say it gave him a motive for killing her, so he was asking my advice. What was it she knew about him? He didn't tell me, and I didn't ask. But I want to know who killed Marco, Mr. Malansky. And since I am a little disappointed in Tony over here for letting this all happen right under his nose, 
that Tony's going to make up for it by helping you find the killer. Isn't that right, Tony? Yes, sir. Oh, now, now, wait a second. Take them both back to the hotel. Hey, hey I don't work for you. You can't do this. Hey, hey, look. All right, all right, I'll watch. What is this? It's a subpoena. It ensures your presence at this hearing. I may need you to testify. Testify? What's to testify? I told you I had nothing to do with Diane's murder, and I have no idea who did. The writer you went to the play with said you went outside to have a cigarette during the first intermission and didn't return until the third act. Oh, so I had several cigarettes. Like I told you, the play stank. Make yourself comfortable, Miss Sloan. Lieutenant! Where did you find this jar? It was lying a few feet from the victim's body. Because of the presence of blood and tissue, it was believed to be the murder weapon. In fact, Your Honor, this jar has been stipulated by counsel to be the murder weapon. And did you then have the jar examined for fingerprints? Yes, sir. And for purposes of probable cause only, what was discovered? A fingerprint matching the defendant's right thumb was identified. And what did you do next? Search warrants for the defendant's office, home, and car were executed. And what was found? A gold necklace and bracelet belonging to the decedent were discovered in a desk drawer in the defendant's office. Thank you, Lieutenant. Mr. Whalen, may I? Thank you. Now, Lieutenant Brennan, did you find the defendant's fingerprints anywhere else on this candy jar? We found prints from her left hand up near the top. If a woman were to pick up a heavy jar like this to look at it, would you expect her to use one hand or two? Two. Like this. Right hand on the base, left hand near the top. Possibly. Did you find the defendant's fingerprints anywhere else in Miss Draper's apartment? They were all over the place. Door jam, desk, chair. And were they all over the victim's jewelry as well? We didn't find any prints on the jewelry. Not even the victims? The stuff had been wiped clean. Don't you think it's strange, Lieutenant, that the defendant would wipe all her fingerprints from that jewelry? Jewelry she then put into her own desk, and after doing that, not bother to remove a single print of hers from the scene of the murder? Objection. Relevancy. Mr. Mason is commencing his argument. Sustained. Withdrawn. Nothing further. You want to look through our files? Uh, we believe one of your cars was recently involved in a hit-and-run accident during which one of its headlights was broken. What we'd really like to do is take a look at your damage reports. Sorry. You can't see a thing without a court order. Yeah, well, court orders take a lot of time, and we don't have a lot of time. Corporate policy is very strict on such matters, okay? You want to go through our files, you got to have a court order or an okay from the senior vice president. So call the senior vice president. Oh, in your dreams. Look, if you don't help us Ken, out, Ken, the wrong please. person. Could I have a sec? Let me introduce myself. My name is Tony Loomis. I am a dear, dear friend of Mr. Nardone. Are you aware who Mr. Nardone is? Thank you. Uh, I'll just go talk to the senior vice president on your behalf right now. Yeah, uh, please, have a seat. Yeah, can okay. I get you anything? You want Diet Cola? Nah, we're fine. Yeah, no, I'm fine. What did you say to him? I just made sure he understood how important it was for us to find that car. Who's Collier? <clears throat> How long have you been a decedent's executive assistant? About uh, three and a half years. And your job entailed what? I made sure that whatever she wanted done got done. Would you say that it entailed working closely with her? Yes, 
Very closely, uh, ten hours a day, sometimes six days a week. So you knew her well? Yes, very well. And as someone who knew her very well, how would you characterize the relationship between her and the defendant, Lauren Jeffers? Were they friends? No. Enemies? Competitors. Simply stated, there was bad blood between them, was there not? Yes. Didn't they have a violent argument which you witnessed last year? Yes. And isn't it true that to your knowledge, they didn't talk to each other for over a year until the defendant barged into a New York restaurant last week and verbally attacked Ms. Draper? That's true, <clears throat> yes. What is your relationship to the defendant, Miss Collier? Uh, she, she, she's my mother. And even you, Lauren Jeffrey's own daughter, can't deny the fact that the defendant was violently angry with Diane Draper, can you? No, Thank I... Thank you, nothing further. Thank you. Don't cross-examine her. Lauren, I can't let this stand. Perry, please. Mr. Mason. A moment to confer with my client, Your Honor. Perry, let it stand, please. I don't want her embarrassed. It's difficult already as it is. Cross, Mr. Mason. No questions, Your Honor. Witness may step down. Your Honor, for this next witness, the state calls Perry Mason. I understand that you witnessed a confrontation between the decedent and Ms. Jeffries at the La Mistral restaurant last month. I saw them discussing something. I'm not sure confrontation is the right word. The discussion was loud, wasn't it? I couldn't make out what they were saying, so no, I wouldn't say it was particularly loud. Would you say that we're more agitated? Animated is the word I'd use. Mr. Mason, could you see their expressions? Yes. Well, would you say the women looked calm or angry? I'd say they looked earnest. You didn't answer my question. Your question was badly phrased. You're being deliberately evasive, aren't you? I'm answering your questions as best I can. You're playing semantic games with me, Mr. I'm Mason. I'm doing no such thing. And in doing thing. so, you're depriving this court of the truth. I am Gentlemen. being a responsible How could you witness? behave like Gentlemen. this, counselor? A man of your reputation. Gentlemen. Uh, my reputation has nothing to do with it. Gentlemen, please, stop this at once. We just had an argument, didn't we? Yes. One that was every bit as acrimonious as the one Miss Jeffries and the decedent had in that restaurant. Isn't that correct, Mr. Mason? What we had, Mr. Whalen, was just a difference of opinion between two professionals. Intense, perhaps, but I still like you, Mr. Whalen. Just because two people have an argument doesn't mean they harbor ill feelings toward each other. Doesn't mean they're going to go to war. I have no further questions. You may step down, Mr. Mason. That's it, they're jerking us around. This guy's history and so is his boss. Oh, sit down, don't you ever get tired of talking like a two-bit hood? Hey, the way I talk gets results, and that's what life's about, college boy getting results, so just shut your face and let me handle this. Uh, sorry to keep you waiting. Uh, gentlemen, this is Deborah Richards, Senior Vice President of Triborough Auto Rental. Hi. Uh, Gerald here told me you want to go through our damage reports. I'm afraid that's out of the question. Wait, listen, ma'am. I'm sorry. Corporate policy forbids it. I'd like to help you, but I just can't. No, no, no. Obviously, you Tony, don't... Tony, Miss Richards, could we talk privately for a moment? Uh, you have to excuse my friend. Sometimes he gets a little temperamental. You know, I was thinking... Thank <laughs> you.
All right. The garage is 10 blocks up 1420. I'll have someone meet you there. Thanks. We really appreciate it. You coming? What'd you say to her? Oh, I just told her how important it was that we find that car. Results, Tony. That's what life's about. Okay, if it'll make you stop pouting, I asked if we'd go down to the lot and take a look at the cars that were returned to them damaged. Here you go. That's all you said? That's all I said. You don't always have to be a bully to get results, Tony. Get out of my face. I think somebody gave you a call about us? Yeah, you're the guys who want to see the cars. We've got scheduled for shop work. That's us. Well, here they are. Wow. All these cars, huh? Yep. These and seven more floors. She said something like, I'm going to have it out with you for once and for all, Diane. Then they went inside. And after you got back from walking your dog, what happened? Well, I was in the living room reading when I heard Diane yelling at someone next door. I couldn't make out exactly what she was saying, but she sounded furious. <laughs> then I heard a thump. Thump. And then a bump. A bump. And after that, nothing. Hmm. Any idea what time that was? 8.20. I remember looking at the clock. 8.20. 8.20. According to the security guard's testimony, that was a good five minutes before the defendant was seen leaving the building. Thank you. You're welcome. Is uh, that all? That's all. Ms. Wilson, are you married? My husband died six years ago. Oh, I'm sorry. Any children? Just my daughter, Shannon. And she's how old? Fifteen. Was she home that night? No, she was out with friends. On a school night? I told her to be home by 10 o'clock, and she was. I notice you're not wearing a watch. Ever wear one? No. I have very sensitive skin. <laughs> watch bands give me a rash. <laughs> I'm sorry. Do you uh, watch a lot of TV? Oh, I hardly watch any. My daughter does, but I'd rather read. So when you're home by yourself, as you were that night, the only way for you to know what time it is, is to look at a clock. Well, yes. Thank you. I have no more questions. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. <laughs> Witness may step down. Oh, thank you, Your Honor. The state rests its case, Your Honor. Very well. Is the defense ready to proceed? Yes, it is. Uh, Defense calls Shannon Wilson to the stand. Miss Wilson, what time did you get home the night Diane Draper was murdered? Ten o'clock. Are you sure it was ten? Yeah, just ask my mom. The thing is, when I ask the security guard who keeps a record of everyone who enters and leaves the building, he said you got home at 10.30. He did? Wow, it, um, he must have made a mistake. Shannon, isn't it true that before you went out that night, you set all the clocks in your mother's apartment back so you could spend an extra half hour with your boyfriend? Isn't that true? And isn't it true that you reset all the clocks before your mother got up the next morning so she'd never know what you'd done? I wouldn't do something like that to my mother. Shannon, this lady could be your mother. And this lady is on trial for murder. Now, it's very, very important that you tell the truth. All right, I, I set the clocks back a half an hour. I'm sorry. So... When you got home that night, it was really 10.30, not 10 o'clock. 
which means when your mother heard those sounds coming from next door, it was really 8.50, not 8.20, which means the murder occurred some 25 minutes after the defendant was seen leaving the building. Thank you, Shannon. Nothing further. Mr. Whalen? No questions. Witness may step down. Here you go, my man. He's on his way. He's on his way. You'll see. Hey, you want something? I'll have this. Yeah, make that clean. Grazie. There you go. Thanks a lot. I still can't believe we went through 793 cars and still couldn't find the one we were looking for. That's because the guy who whacked Marco just hasn't turned it in yet, that's all. Now you know, educated guess. The guy figured people ask fewer questions if he turned it in after he got the headlights fixed. I mean, that's what I would do. Yeah, I guess that's what I'd do too. Just wait right here. Just out of curiosity, how'd you end up working for a guy like Albert Nardone? I was born in the Bronx. Went to grammar school St. John Vianney, went to high school St. Helena's. Got to know some people who knew some people. How'd you wind up being a yuppie lawyer? Born in Providence, St. Wenceslas Grammar School, Casimir Pulaski High School, college and law school in Denver. Denver? Uh, did my graduate work in Brooklyn, the Knights of St. Paul. That's where I learned to shoot pool. <laughs> I learned to shoot pool at the National Polish Alliance then. Polish Center? You any good? No, I just play for fun. Ah, oh, yuppie lawyer hustle. I love it. Got to play you sometime, see how good you are. Yeah, sure, sometime. Yo, Rocket, you got here quick, just like I asked. I like that. Hey. Tell them what we're looking for. You mean the car? Of course I mean the car. All right, uh, according to what the mechanic at Triborough said about this year's fleet, it's a 91 Ford Taurus, brown. Yeah. Broken right headlight, possible dent in the hood, possible dent in the right front fender. Yeah. Got that? Got it. So get going. Come on, get out of here. What the hell was that about? You'll see. Come on. Come on. Yeah, all right, all right. Come to order. All rise. Department 79 is now in session. The Honorable Renee Trayball presiding. Be seated. Mr. Mason, I believe that you were about to call your next witness. Your Honor, may we approach? Your Honor, a witness has come forward whose testimony is extremely relevant to this case. The state moves to reopen his case in chief so that she may be called without delay. Now, in anticipation of defense counsel's objections, I can cite at least three cases where similar motions were granted. I have no objections, Mr. Whalen. You don't? No, I don't. Oh. In fact, you can put her on the stand right now. Really? Really. I just ask that when you're through, I be granted a recess so I can prepare a competent cross-examination. Mr. Whalen? Great. Very well. Granted. Mrs. Cooper. How are you? Good. How's the neighborhood? Nice. Good. I understand the window of your kitchen affords you an unobstructed view of the entrance to the garage of the decedent's apartment building. Is that correct? That's right, huh? Please tell the court what you saw the night Diane Draper was murdered. Well, when I went in the kitchen around a quarter to nine to get a snack, I noticed someone standing outside on the sidewalk by the garage like they were waiting for someone. I didn't think anything of it, of course. But on my way out of the kitchen, I saw that a car had just come out of the garage, and as the door started coming down after it, this lady all of a sudden ducks underneath it and goes inside. You saw her enter the apartment building via the garage? That's right, uh-huh. What makes you so sure it was a quarter till nine? I was watching TV. My favorite sitcoms were on that night. I got up during the commercial, so it must have been about a quarter to. Is the person you saw that night here in this courtroom today? Uh-huh. That's her over there. Let the record show that the witness pointed without hesitation to the defendant, Lauren Jeffries.
Cooper, I'm glad your health is good. I'm glad your neighborhood is nice. Now, why did it take you so long to come forward? Because I didn't realize what I saw that night was important until I saw her picture in the paper a couple of days ago. You're absolutely certain the defendant is the person you saw into the garage that night? Absolutely, uh-huh. Your Honor, at this time, I'd like to conduct the brief experiment we discussed in chambers. Again, I object. Again, you're overruled. In view of the situation, I believe that Mr. Mason is more than entitled to a little leeway. Bayless, proceed, Mr. Mason. Thank you, Your Honor. Now, Ms. Cooper, would you say the distance from where you are sitting to the back of the courtroom is greater or less than the distance from your kitchen window to the sidewalk outside the garage? Less than, definitely. And would you say there is more light <clears throat> at the back of the courtroom than there was on the sidewalk that night, or less light? More. Once again, Ms. Cooper, would you point to the person you saw duck into the garage of the decedent's apartment building the night of the murder? The second one from the right, that, sir. The second from the right. Let the record show that the witness did not point to the defendant, but I do think I know why you thought you were pointing to her, Mrs. Cooper. Now, Ms. Cooper, I handed you a newspaper when you took the stand. Would you please open it to the front page? Now, that's the newspaper article and picture you mentioned you saw a couple of days ago, was it not? Yes. The person you just pointed to is wearing the exact same thing Ms. Jeffries was wearing in that photo. That's why you assumed she was Lauren Jeffries, is it not? From what you saw in that paper? Yes, I guess so. Thank you, Ms. Jeffries. Now, are you absolutely certain it was Lauren Jeffries you saw enter the garage that night? No, I guess not. Thank you, Ms. Cooper. No further questions. This place does the best work in the city. Got cars booked for repairs clear into next month. The one you're looking for? Yeah, I think this is it. This has got to be it. Nice work. Here, give me that. Rocket, you're a genius, huh? Hey, Tony. Go buy yourself a slide rule or something. Come on. Get out of here. Call you. It's fantastic. It's great to have a friend in the auto industry. He's in the car business? My buddy can strip a car faster than you could write up some legal paper. Huh? Is the rental agreement in there? Yeah, here it is. your name on it? Yep. JFK, make it fast. Hi, Kim. My name's Ken Melansky. I work with Perry Mason. This is my friend Tony Loomis. Could we talk to you for a second? Hey. Forget about JFK. Hey, come on. I got to get there. Where are you going so fast? I'm on assignment. Not anymore. We found the car you used to kill Marco Sabatini. What, what are you talking about? This is a copy of the rental agreement. Your credit card, your signature. Hey, I didn't sign this. I lost my credit card weeks ago. I don't know what you're yeah, talking you're about. My boss will want to talk to you anyway. So come yeah, on. This is where you and I part company. What the hell are you doing? What's going on? Hey, Cam, you see what I got here? Come on, yes, Tony. Sir. You, you can't, can't do this. You can't do it. Come on, man. Get out of here. Hey, taxi! What can I do for you? I'm here to see Mr. Nardone. And your name? That's not important. What's well, important to me? I'll tell you what's important. I'm here to consult with Mr. Nardone on some new fabrics. Evidently, he doesn't like his periwinkle. Well, I don't know. You don't know? Look, I'm on a tight schedule. 
You'll just have to tell Mr. Nardone. I'll see him sometime next week. Hey, hey, okay, okay, just wait a minute. The dart. Hey, hey, come back here. He's coming with me. I'm sorry, Mr. Nardone. All right, all right, all right. Don't worry about it, all right, Mr. Malansky? As far as you're concerned, he took a cab to the airport. He was never seen again. I said he's coming with me. I can you us. What's the difference? He's going to get what he deserves. We don't right? know what he deserves, Tony. He killed my cousin. You don't know that for sure. Just like we don't know for sure he killed Diane Draper. And nobody will know anything for sure if you kill him. Escort Mr. Malansky back to town. Will you get him, please? Yeah. Go on, get him. Hey. Said I escort him, not rough him, huh? I'm not leaving here without him. You're pushing your luck, college boy. Let, let him go, let him go. Tony. You better know what you're doing. Because I can always settle the score with him. And you, later. Come on. Let him go. All right, Tony. Where were we? You had reason to believe the decedent knew about your involvement in pornography, did you not? Yes. You were worried she was going to expose you in her next column, is that not correct? Yes. Which is why you went to her apartment that night. I never went to her apartment that night. You tried to talk her out of writing about you, and when that failed, you killed her. I couldn't have killed her. I was with someone that night. Julia called you? Yes. Call her up here, ask her. You were at her place? Yes. When did you get there? 7.30. And when did you leave? When she did, around 10. You were in her apartment the whole time from 7.30 till 10? Yes. Did you have dinner while you were there? Yes. What did you eat, do you recall? We had Chinese. <laughs> Where did the Chinese food come from? You went out and picked it up, did you not? You were gone from Ms. Collier's apartment from 8.30 to 9.15, is that correct? It wasn't that long. The building where Diane Draper lived is only eight blocks from Julia Collier's and only three blocks from the Chinese takeout, is that not correct? Wait a minute. You had 45 minutes. It would have been no problem at all for you to walk from Julia's to Diane's to the takeout and back again. Is that not correct? I didn't do that, I swear. Of course you didn't. Mr. Whalen. No questions, Your Honor. Witnesses excused. Court will reconvene at 10 tomorrow morning. All rise. Congratulations. Looks like things are really looking out for you, huh? They are now. Considering what just happened here, I can finally go back to Los Angeles. I'm afraid it's not over yet. Keep this opinion. The judge said that you could leave. Perry, so we can't actually prove that Kim Weatherly did it. Let's face it, we don't have to. After today's testimony, there's certainly a reasonable doubt that Warren killed Diane Draper. All right, you tell me. What is the judge going to do? I don't want to move for a dismissal until we have this case nailed down. Well, I've been through Kim's file a thousand times. We don't have any more on him. Maybe the answer isn't Kim. Kim isn't the killer? The killer typed a column which implicated Lauren, 
sent it to the computer at the magazine, stole, and probably destroyed the disk which contained the original column. Now, is that correct? So? Remember the Cold War? We discovered we could tell what the Russians were up to because they accused us of doing whatever it was they were doing. You think the killer wrote a column accusing Lauren of taking bribes because he was taking bribes? He or she, yes. It's an interesting theory. You know, this may sound silly, but I heard that Diane had a very big fight with Pietro Arnati, and she swore she'd never advertise or wear his line again. Is that right, Lauren? As far as I know. Look at these photos. When she was murdered, she was wearing an Arnati scarf. Was she wearing that scarf when you went to see her that night? I really don't remember. Well, try. I'm sorry. I don't remember. It's late. I'll uh, see you all tomorrow. Thank you very much. Good night, Lauren. Perry? Something's wrong. Very wrong. Remain seated. Come to order. Department 79 is now in session. The Honorable Renee Trayball presiding. Mr. Mason. Um, defense recalls Julia Collier to the stand. What are you doing? I think you know. Perry, no. She's my daughter. After 25 years, we're finally together. Please don't do this. You, uh, you knew Pietro Arnati, did you not? Yes. You also knew Marco Sabatini? Yes. Would you tell the court, please, who he was? He was a clothing designer based here in New York. Mr. Sabatini was recently killed in a hit-and-run car accident, was he not? Yes. Miss Collier, my associate, Mr. Milansky, is showing you bank records, which we will mark Defense Exhibit D. Those records show your deposits for the past year. You recognize them? Yes, these are my records. Now, he is also showing you bank records, which we will mark Defense Exhibit E. Those records contain all of the withdrawals from the account of Marco Sabatini for the past year. Now, would you explain why it is that in four separate instances, when Mr. Sabatini withdrew certain sums from his account, you deposited the exact same sums to your account? I don't know, coincidence? Four times in the past year, clothes designed by Mr. Sabatini received extremely favorable coverage in the magazine you work for. So? So, wasn't Mr. Sabatini paying you in exchange for rave reviews? I wasn't the one taking bribes, Mr. Mason. Who was? Diane thought it was my mother. You mean according to Diane's column written the night of the murder? Yes. We discovered yesterday that Mr. Weatherly is unable to fully account for his whereabouts on the night of the murder, which means your whereabouts that night are not fully verified. Well, I was at home waiting for Kim to return. Do you always send the people you invite for dinner out to get their own Chinese? Well, no, but, but by the time I got home that night, I was too tired to cook. I mean, Kim was very understanding. You invited Kim over so he, he could give you some semblance of an alibi, did you not? I have no idea what you're talking about. I'm talking about the phone call Marco Sabatini made to you after Diane left his showroom that morning. You now have a copy of his phone records in front of you. He told you Diane had found out about the bribes you'd been taking. He told you she planned to expose the two of you in her column. So you invited Kim over? sent him out for Chinese food, then left the apartment shortly after he did and went over to Diane. No, I did not. You went through her garage and went up to her apartment. 
You tried to talk her out of exposing you. When she refused, you simply killed her. No, no. Then you sat down at her computer and transmitted a column that you had written, that you had written, which accused Lauren Jeffries of crimes you had committed. You transmitted that column to the computer at the magazine so she'd be blamed for the murder. No. Then you left, taking with you the computer disc containing Diane's column and jewelry. Jewelry you later planted at your mother's office to further implicate her. You also removed other evidence that proved you'd been taking bribes. Nothing that you're saying is true, all right? Nothing. Oh, it is true, Ms. Collier. It is true. So is the fact that you stole Kim Weatherly's credit card when he returned to your apartment that night. No! You stole his card and used it a few days later to rent a car. A car you then used to kill the one person who was still a threat to you. That person was Marco Sabatini. You know, you can't prove any of this. None of it. Oh, but I can, Miss Collier. I can prove all of it. Mr. Williger, please stand. I can call this young man as a witness. He waited on you at the agency where you rented the car. Now, Mr. Johansson, would you please stand? Mr. Molensky. Mr. Johansson is the mechanic who waited on you at the repair shop where you took the car to get fixed after the hit and run. We can call him as a witness, or we can enter that scarf into evidence as defense exhibit F. That scarf was found near Diane when you and the others found her dead. Was she wearing it when she was killed? No, Ms. Collier. She was not. You were wearing it. When you killed her, you got blood all over it. Blood all over it. You threw it near her, hoping people would think it was hers. Now, you did that, did you not? No, I did not do that. I mean, yes, the scarf is mine, but Diane borrowed it from me. No. I... It's a Pietro Arnotti scarf. A scarf she would never wear. <laughs> Oh, well, you, you must be very happy now, hmm? This time you'll be rid of me for good, won't you? Your mother suspected you all along. Diane told her about you and Marco, but she said nothing to me, nothing. She always tried to protect you, always. Yet you were willing to shut her away for life. Why? Because I hate her. I hated her when I was five. I hated her when I was 25. And I hate her now. In view of these developments, Your Honor, I move that the case against my client be dismissed. Prosecution concurs. So moved. Case dismissed. Bailiff, see to it that Miss Collier is properly attended to. This court is now adjourned. All rise. Just an act. Wasn't it? Mr. Mason. 
I look forward to the next time. Well, for what it's worth, this time wasn't easy. Wasn't? How old are you, Mr. Whalen? I'm uh, 29. Why? I wish I'd been as competent as you when I was your age. Thank you. Can I buy you dinner tonight? Oh, give me a rain check, will you? Uh, no, I have a better idea. The next time we oppose each other and you win, I'll buy you dinner. Thank you. Hmm. I think. Hey, Mr. Malaski. Your boss does uh, nice work. Oh, thanks. I'll pass that along. Mr. Malansky, you saved me from making a big mistake. Uh, I owe you. Oh, no, you don't. Yes, I do. Hey, there's got to be something Miss Nardone could do for you. Oh, Ken. How very thoughtful of you. Oh. It's lovely. It's a gangster original, huh? What's wrong? Oh, uh, Ken, it's it's so sweet of you, but and, and it's a gorgeous dress. But it's just not my style. Oh, sure it is. No, Ken, I I won't have you spending a lot of money for something that I'll never wear. I want you to return it. Return it? Well, that's no problem, is it? Made me do it. <laughs> uh, let me see where is it. Yeah, uh, there.
No, you have got to change it. It's terrible. Damien, dear boy, the lighting is more than sufficient. Do not call me dear boy. All right? All right. And it's sufficient as if it were a mortuary. But if you don't mind, I would like to see my painting. I mean, that's the whole thing. Hello? Hello? I'd like to, uh, I'd like to speak with the director. Oh, very well, sir. I'll get her for you if you would just sign our guest register. Of course. Thank you. I'm Renee Murian, Mr. Angelo, how do you do? How do you do? I understand that recently you sold a Truman York for 1.2.3 million. Well, yes, as a matter of fact, we did. Winston Hope? Yes. Ah, what a shame. He's always one step ahead. Then you must know Hope is the foremost York collector in the world. Yes, I know. Unfortunately for me. However, if you're interested, Mr. Angelo, I do have another York I could show you. Really? I'd be very interested. This way. Beautiful work, don't you think? So typical of York's subtlety in the use of color and space. Mr. Angelo, what are you doing? Please! Hurry, go, hurry! I wouldn't do that! I'd have to tell him you're dealing with forgeries. The one you saw, Winston Hope. Interesting use of color and space, don't you think? You know, good supplies, don't you? No, but he's insane. Truman York. You're insane. York died. Five years ago. But they never recovered his body. What are you saying? Are you saying your kids are dead? Damien, where are you going? Damien! No, I'm afraid we don't have any hot days at the moment. But we're expecting several from California very soon. Well, thank you very much. You're quite welcome. Oh, excuse me. If you have any questions, my name is Maureen. Is Mr. Graff in? You're? Just tell him it's an old friend from Mexico. Mr. Graff, a gentleman to see you. Says he's an old friend from Mexico? Thanks. Yes, sir. Thanks. If you'll just follow me. What are you doing here? What the hell are you thinking about? I just came in for the day. Maybe two. Well, you shouldn't be here at all. It's too dangerous. Did you see this? From Art International? The Murian Gallery sold that painting to Winston Hope for over a million dollars. Yes, I know. It's a fake. I thought it might be, but then again, I thought it might be one of your earlier works I didn't know about. So anyway, I flew in this morning and I went to see Renee Nurian. And guess what? She's got another of my fakes on the wall. You know what I did? What? I destroyed it. You destroyed it? Have you gone mad? Why draw attention to yourself like that? The point is, Philip, I want you to get to the bottom of it. Well, I would love to get to the bottom of it. But if there are other fakes of the quality of Hope's painting, then we have an obvious problem. They're still forgeries. Yes, but only one person can swear to that. You. And you're supposed to be dead. Oh, Truman. I worry about you. If it becomes known that you're still alive, then that two things can happen, both bad. Oh, tell me. Well, somebody could inform the police. Oh, and? Well, the price of your work could drop by 50%. Mm -hmm. And you'd have to cut your prices then, wouldn't you? Well, I don't, do, I don't represent you just for money. I do it because you're my friend. In the first place, I don't think anyone recognized me. Second, 
A flood of forgeries in the market is not going to raise my price, is it? No. All right, I'll try to see what I can find out. Good. I'm registered at the Brown Palace Hotel under the name Angelo. Michelangelo? Why not? I'll be in touch if I find out anything. Michelangelo, Michelangelo. <laughs> Winston Hope, please. Maureen Gilman. Winston, I've got interesting news. What's up? Another shipment from south of the border? You might say that. Truman York showed up. What the hell are you talking about? Just what I said. He was just in here talking to Philip. He's staying at the Brown Palace Hotel. Calls himself Michelangelo. <sighs> he always was a little pretentious. He told Philip that Don't mention it to anyone. You know me. I'm afraid I do. So don't worry, I'll make it worth your while. Mmm, I just love it when you talk money. No kidding. I probably should have called first, but I uh, figured if I just showed up, I could cushion the shock or something. I don't understand any of this. What about the accident? I survived it. I hid out in the mountains until they stopped looking for me, and I managed to make it to Mexico. And that's where you've been? All this time? That's where I've been. Straightening myself out. Painting. Keeping a low profile. Wow. Why didn't you let me know? To be honest with you, I didn't. I didn't think you'd want to know. Well, what about the police? Why would you take the chance of coming back here? I had to see you. Me? What for? A second chance. <gasps> Miss Anne, I know how badly I screwed up. Things are different now. I'm different. I've been off drugs for four years, and all I can think about is being back together again. True, please. I love you, I love you. Probably more than I ever did. Philip's been, Philip's been keeping me up to date. So I know you're not involved, are you? You've been in touch with Philip? We, I, I just left him. Somebody's been dumping forgeries of my work on the market, but what do you say? I say you're going too fast. I can't even think straight. We had something pretty special, pretty, pretty damn marvelous, in fact. At least I screwed it up, but we can have it again. Come back to Mexico with me. We live like royalty. You can, you can sculpt and I'll paint, but we'll do it together. But this is all too much for me. I'll be in town until tomorrow.
You don't know. You have no idea how many nights I cried myself to sleep when I thought you were dead. I know what I must have put you through. I'm so sorry. Please forgive me. So many bad memories to get over. I know. Look. I I just need a little time to sort everything out. I'll call you in the morning. I promise. Overcoat. You're Truman York, aren't you? Ah, uh, no. No, I think you're mistaken. Turn around and I'll shoot. Security! Face me, damn it! Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. <laughs> you know who I am, don't you? I, I, don't, I don't know what you're talking about. You ought to know. You, you, you killed my wife. I, I, uh, mister, you got the wrong you murdering bastard! <laughs> Are you all right? Uh, yes, I'm fine. Uh, would you, uh, would you have somebody go up to 308 and bring my bag down, please? Uh, would you have a, uh, a phone I could use? Yes, sir. Right this way. It's Truman. Um, listen, I got a problem. Well, um, someone's on to me. Is there any chance that I could uh, crash at the studio tonight? I'll explain it all later. Please. Oh, that's great, baby. That's great. J just leave the key above the door for me. Thanks, baby. Thanks. Right? Right. In the morning. I lost him. We better call the police. All right. Taxi, sir? Yes. Where are we headed? 122 Market Street. Hey, you can put it in here. Thank you. Thank you very much. <sighs> Follow that cab. Step on.
Long believed dead, the well-known artist reappeared in Denver on Saturday morning, was found murdered in an artist's studio Sunday morning. York was apparently killed in a tragic motorcycle accident five years ago. Police have arrested noted photographer Joel McKelvey on suspicion of first-degree murder. McKelvey's wife died in that same motorcycle wreck. So, why did this McKelvey call on us for representation? <laughs> Obviously, he wants the best. Tell me this. Why are we interested in representing him? He's a friend of mine. From where? From pre-law, I minored in art, so did Joel. I thought it would be a breeze that almost blew my GPA. Anyway, I ended up here, and he went on to become a famous photographer, and the world was deprived of one more Perry Mason. Poor world. You didn't answer my question. Why do we want to represent him? Because he's innocent. I know him. He couldn't have done it. He wouldn't have done it. Just like that, huh? Yeah, well, sort of. Just like that. Well, then. We sort of better talk to him. Just like that. She was just a kid from a small town in Minnesota. And he was this, you know, glamorous celebrity. She didn't have a chance. And then he, then he killed her. He almost killed himself at the same time. I wish he had. But I swear, I had nothing to do with his murder. I had no reason to kill him. Mr. McKelvey, why would anyone believe that? Don't you see? The day he killed Diane, he was drugged out of his skull. The cops saw him. He was still facing a charge of vehicular homicide. That's why he went down to Mexico. I and mean, the point is, he was still facing a long prison sentence. All I had to do was sick the cops on him. Why did you follow York's cab? I don't know. I guess I still wanted him to admit to me face to face that he'd killed Diane. I even followed him upstairs, but just as I had my hand on the knob, well, I finally realized I'd only make a complete fool of myself. So, I just went away. How did you know York would be at the Brown Palace Hotel? I got a call at my studio, and then I went over there and waited. Who called? I don't know. It's just some guy who said York was staying at the hotel under the name of Angelo. I didn't recognize the voice. Where were you at the time of the murder? I was home, alone. No witnesses? No witnesses. Well, what do you think, Mr. Mason? I think, I think I want the truth. If you didn't intend to shoot him, why did you bring a gun to the hotel? The truth. When I went to the hotel, I did want to kill him. Sorry. All right, we'll represent you. Don't be sorry for telling the truth. Thank you. Thank you both. Do I have a chance? Everybody has a chance, Mr. McKelvey. You have one very good friend. We'll try to make it two. When I was an undergraduate, I remember seeing this film about painters. And there was a whole section on York. That's where I met Joel. We had this professor, Dr. Bainsworth, who collected these interviews on videotape. Almost every contemporary artist you could think of in York was one of them. Well, we should see the one on York. Bainsworth was a real fanatic. He used to feed all the tapes into a computer. What for? To make it easier for research. I could try to get the York tapes from Dr. Bainsworth. I'm not sure he's still at the university. I'm not sure where he is. Della. I'll start calling first thing in the morning. And what will we be doing? Well, you and Joel will be finding out who knew Mr. York was still alive and in the city. I'm sorry. 
I've just been this emotional basket case since it happened. I've been looking for another studio. And every time I walk in here, I just... You were the one who found him. I called him. There was no answer, so I drove down here. He was just lying there. See somebody you love like. Anyhow, I was I was so hysterical when I called the police. I don't know how they even understood what I was saying. But five years ago, weren't you the one who walked out? That doesn't mean I didn't love him. I just couldn't live with him anymore. He was into drugs then? Drugs, alcohol, other women. I just got to the point where I felt I had to save myself. Why did he come to see you? Wanted me to come back to Mexico with him. Swore he was clean now and that he still loved me. He said we could live like kings down there. And what did you say? Nothing. So shocked at seeing him alive, I could barely talk. I went home that night and thought about it, and I finally decided I'd see yes when I saw him in the morning. Nothing here for me anymore. And God knows I loved him. I never stopped loving him. Mrs. York. I need to ask a few more questions. How long were the two of you together? We met when I was a student at the art center. He was teaching a drawing class. We were married three months later. That was nine years ago. Excuse me. Those were Truman's canvases. This whole place used to be his. When he was gone, I took it over. I could just never bring myself to get rid of any of his things. You said there was nothing for you here. Well, there's nobody I'm really close to, and my work hasn't exactly been taking the art world by storm. I certainly like what I see. You're on a very short list. The only reason I've survived this long is, except for one, I've had to sell all the paintings Truman left behind when he disappeared. Sold to whom? A man named Winston Hope. He was a big collector of Truman's. Did he know your husband was still alive? I don't know. But there's one man who knew. Philip Graff. He's your husband's art dealer. Truman said that Philip had been keeping him up to date and that he had just seen him. Well, thank you for your time, Mrs. York. I'm... Sorry, I had to intrude. I take it you don't believe that Joel McKelvey killed my husband? No, I don't. I hope whoever did do it burns in hell. Goodbye, Ms. York. As a matter of fact, I didn't believe it was York, even after Damien said so. Not until I saw his picture in the paper after the murder. Excuse me, who's Damien? Damien Blakely, a young painter. I'm giving him a one-man show here next week. Hey, 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 you. Be careful with that. It's worth more than you are. Did Blakely know York personally? I, I don't think so. But he took off right after York did. And he seemed pretty upset, too. 
You said your claim the painting he destroyed was a fake. Was it? No. My insurance company authenticated it and they've agreed to pay me for the loss. Where'd you get the painting originally? From a collector in England when I was there last autumn. Lord Kingsley? Miss Scott here says that your claim to painting you sold to Winston Hope was also a forgery. Yes, but as far as I know, it's also genuine. I got it from the estate of a collector in California last year. Did you know York personally? No. OK. Oh, and by the way, did either one of you tell anybody York was here that day? I told you. I, I didn't believe it was him. Well, thanks for your cooperation. Goodbye. Bye. Bye. From now on, you don't open your mouth about any goings-on in this gallery. Do you hear me? Now, kindly return to the desk. What the hell was that all about? Damien, how long have you been here? Long enough to know that I don't like that guy. Who is he? His name's Milansky. He works for Perry Mason, Joel McKelvey's lawyer. Yeah, I've heard of Mason. He could be trouble. Yes, I knew Truman York was still alive. And yes, I did correspond with him from time to time. Why didn't you tell anyone? He was my friend. Uh, maybe I was wrong to protect him, but I... I like to think that somebody would have done the same for me one day, if it had ever been necessary. I also knew that he was carrying on with your wife. I'm sorry. I tried to talk him out of it, but Lizanne was about to leave him. York came to see you the day he was killed. He told his wife. She told Perry Mason. He told me. Yes, he was here. And you know, he, he finally seemed to have uh, pulled himself together. Did you mention to anyone that you'd seen him? No, of course not. What did he want? Well, he was concerned about some forgeries of his work. There were two that he knew of. He wanted me to do something about it. Did you do anything? No. That night he was killed. You're probably the world's leading authority on York. <laughs> Why didn't you challenge the authenticity? Well, York destroyed the one in the Nurian Gallery. And as for Hope's alleged fake, it's a brilliant work. <sighs> Until Saturday, I had no reason to believe that there were any fakes on the market. Joel, over the years, I've sold a great many of your photographs. We go back a long way. I don't believe that you killed Truman York. And I assume that since he is defending you, Mr. Mason doesn't believe it either. I assume that too. Then, before you go, then he handed me this check. Hmm. Twenty-five thousand. Very generous. But we're already being paid. He said this isn't a fee. It's a reward for information leading to the arrest and conviction of whomever murdered Truman York, assuming I didn't. Assuming you didn't. Of course, Graf just might be trying to cover his own guilt. All right. What else? Well, Renee Nurian said she didn't really believe it was York, even after this Damien Blakely told her that it was. But if York could make the forgery claim stick, then Nurian would be out of business. So there's the motive. What about opportunity? York signed the guest register at the gallery. Michael Angelo, and he put down the Brown Palace Hotel. 
So she could have followed him from there to Lizanne York's studio, just like Joel did. See if she has an alibi. Damien Blakely is the one who recognized York and followed him out the door. But there's a lot I don't get about him. For example, he's generally considered a third-rate hack. But Nurian's giving him a one-man show. What motive would Damien Blakely have? All right, Ken, check him out. Let's not forget Lizanne York. She'll inherit whatever he had, and she certainly knew where York was when he was killed. Harry Mason's office. Who's calling, please? It's for you. Won't say who it is. Mason. Yes? Yes, I'll be there. Who's that? Some woman wants to meet me. In the garage. Mr. Mason? I think so. I'm Maureen Gilman. I work with Philip Graff. Your client came to see Mr. Graff today. Yes, he did. Philip gave him a check. A reward. Again, yes, he did. I think I have enough information to collect that money. You know who killed Truman York? I think it was Philip Graff, or one other person I could mention. What reason would Graff have had to kill York? I've been Mr. Graff's assistant for the last three years. A couple of times each year, I'd accept delivery of one or two crates from Mexico. Mr. Graff always unpacked them himself. Maybe a week later, he'd announce he'd just acquired another Truman in York somewhere. So you figured York was sending paintings from Mexico and Graff was selling them? York was supposed to be dead, so the paintings brought in huge prices and huge commissions. So? So, the point is, if it came out York was alive, it'd be a big scandal. No more Philip Graff. Who is this uh, other person you were going to mention? Winston Hope. I called him right after York left. I told him York was in town and at the Brown Palace Hotel. Why? When I had scoped out Philip's scam, I contacted Winston and made a deal. I tip him off whenever a crate arrived from Mexico, so he'd get first crack at buying New York. In return, I got 5% of the purchase price. Very enterprising. I also told him York claimed the painting he bought from Renee Nurian was a fake. He paid over a million dollars for it. Miss Gilman, you may indeed have first call on that reward. Good. I'll be in touch. I'll uh, have the check ready. Yes, all right. York sent me maybe a... Uh... Oh. A dozen paintings in the last five years. Which you sold at inflated prices. York's go very high these days. Where were you at the time York was murdered? I was at home, alone in my apartment in Humboldt Street. Can anyone substantiate that? Why would anyone need to? Are you implying that I had anything to do with York's murder? That's insane. He was my friend. And, 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 and why would I want to kill the goose that was laying all those beautiful golden eggs? I'm not implying anything, Mr. Graff. York is dead. Nobody can prove you were selling hardly dried canvases of a dead man, so you're safe. I had nothing to do with True's murder. Did you know York was spending the night at his wife's studio? No. No, he, uh, he told me he was registered at the Brown Palace Hotel. Sir... I can easily subpoena both your telephone records and those from Mrs. York's studio. Yes. All right, he phoned me from her studio. He wanted me to know where he was. The York paintings from Mexico. Did you sell any of those to Winston Hope? Yeah, maybe half. Then he is also a York expert. Tell me, how could he be fooled into buying a fake from René Nurian? Well, 
I believe it is a very brilliant forgery. You see, Mr. Mason, we're not talking about some old master that can be uh, authenticated by structural or chemical analysis or by, by any other scientific technique. To authenticate a contemporary work requires a very special eye. It is an art, a talent. That is not given to just anyone. Now, Mr. Hope is a York enthusiast. But I would suggest that he wants, if he wants another York painting authenticated, then he should employ me. Thank you for your time, Mr. Graff. I'll be in touch. Uh, Mr. Mason, uh, does the news of the uh, Mexican paintings have to be made public? If it helps me defend my client, yes. Thank you. Get your stuff together and get out. I want you gone in 15 minutes. You told him. No, no. I'm sorry. He figured it out for himself. Oh, well, don't worry. I was about to quit anyhow. He's the cheapest boss I ever worked for. I'm sure you'll find something very great very soon. Oh, I'm also counting on that reward money. So take good care of it. Hmm. My name's Ken Melansky. I called for an appointment. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Right, right. Come on in. So, what do you want, Melansky? Well, uh... Oh, yeah, this is Mala Sikorsky. Um, how do you do? Hi. Hi. Uh, I know this is gonna sound like a line or something, but I know that I've seen you before. <laughs> She's one of the highest paid print models in the country. How many covers, babe? At least 15 last year. Modern woman, Nouvelle, elegance, high style. And way back, she used to sit for me. And in between gigs, she still does. Don't you, babe? Sit, stand, lie down, whatever. <laughs> hmm. So, what's all this about? Can I talk to you alone for a minute? I need to ask you some questions about the murder of Truman York. All I know is what I read in the papers. And we can talk in front of Marla. Okay. I understand you were the one that identified York that day he made the disturbance at the Nurian Gallery. I didn't at first. I mean, he just sort of looked familiar. You know, but when he started yelling, fake and destroying the painting, and it all clicked. The receptionist at the gallery says that you left just after he did, and that you seemed to... Upset. I wasn't that upset. I mean, you know, it was like seeing a ghost or something. Mala, why don't you relax for a few minutes? And I rushed out because I had to get back here and get to work. I had already wasted most of the morning at the gallery, and I was way behind in my work getting ready for the show. You one man exhibit, right? Right. You were waiting for me when I got back here. Remember? Mm-hmm. Did you tell anyone else that York was alive and in town? No. Not even Mala. Why not? I guess I didn't think it was anybody else's business. Could you tell me where you were at the time of York's murder? Why the hell should I? Tell it to me or tell it to the court. What time was he killed? Coroner estimates about 10.30 that night. 10.30. The two of us were together. All night, as a matter of fact. 
You were here working that late? I wouldn't exactly call it working. And it wasn't exactly here. I'd say it was much more like play. And it was a mollusk. You don't mind, do you, babe? That true? You and he were together all night long? Do you have a problem with that? No. <laughs> no, I don't have a problem with that. Mind if I take a look around? So, you interested in art? Yeah, I am. All these yours? Sure. Why wouldn't they be? So many different styles. You know Picasso? Do you know how many periods he went through? Picasso. Right. Well, thanks for your time. Sorry to have interrupted your work. Mind if I keep this brochure? No. If you get a chance, come by and see my show. Yeah, I'll try to make it. Nice meeting you. Bye-bye. Some business competitors think that my interest in art is just a cover-up. To con people into thinking that I'm actually human, this, of course, comes from men who have to go to a watchmaker when they have heart problems. <laughs> Do you remember our trek into Tibet? I got you that job, Joe. Yeah, and almost got me killed. You know, some of those photos are in this book. That was one of my first assignments. Joe, you never did sign your book for me. So, how about it? Sure. You know, with the murder trial coming up, I bet your photos could get twice the price. That is a very striking painting. Yes. I got that at York's first show. Turned out to be one of his personal favorites. He almost refused to sell it to me. The York you bought from the Nurian Gallery. Is it here? Sure is beautiful, isn't it? You know, of course, York claimed it was a fake. So I've heard. But I know as much about York as anyone else. And I think it's genuine. Of course, I'll let some experts examine it. If it turns out to be a forgery, I'll put it in the hands of my lawyers. Mr. Mason would like me to ask you a few questions. Really? I thought you'd like to ask me a few questions. Isn't it true that if York were still alive, your collection would drop sharply in value? Perhaps. But you see, Joel, I don't collect Yorks for investment. I collect them because they give me nourishment for the soul. Now, that's a rare commodity for someone in my line of work. Winston, where were you at the time of York's murder? From what I understand, he was killed between 10 and 11 at night. I was having dinner at Chez Louis. With Lizanne York, by the way. Yes. I understand you have personal interest in her. We're good friends, that's it. If you were more than good friends, you might have had a very interesting motive to see York dead. But, as you say, you're just good friends. I'm telling you, there is no collector in England named Lord Kingsley. In fact, there's no Lord Kingsley, period. In other words, you lied to me. Did I say I got it from Lord Kingsley? No, I meant I bought it from an art broker who told me that's why he got it. Ms. Nurian, unless you tell me the truth, we're going to subpoena your records and have each and every York painting you ever sold examined for authenticity. In fact, Mr. Mason may decide to do that anyway. Please. Just the fact that it's being done could make it very rough on the gallery. Yes, sir. Of course, if they do turn out to be fakes, you'll face serious criminal charges. All right, I was lying. But if any Yorks I sold were fakes, I swear I didn't know. Where'd you get them? I mean, he swore to me they were genuine. Who swore? Damien Blakely. Well, where'd he get them? I don't know. You mean you didn't want to know? You had to realize there was a good chance they were fakes. Is that why you're giving him the one-man show, as partial payment for the forgeries? Yes. I mean, no, I told you, I didn't know they were forgeries. You stupid, big mouth fool. Can't you keep Hello, your... Hello, Mr. Blakely, I've got something for you. A subpoena. Yeah? Well, shove it. Might as well take it. You've already been served. I hate that. Wait here, I'll be right back. <laughs> Move 
it. Okay, let's see that subpoena. Don't be an idiot. Looking for this? You drop it along the way. Thanks. You've just been served twice, Mr. Blakely. Yeah, maybe. Believe me, a little fun isn't over yet. Except that he's got an alibi, my money's on Blakely. Your except is serious. Yeah, I know, but he's the one that supplied Nurian with the fake Yorks. He probably forged them himself. And if York exposed him, he'd be in deep trouble. <laughs> well, that certainly gives him a motive, but what makes you think he's the forger? Well, when I was at his studio, I saw these paintings of his. They were in all these different styles, but the main thing is the guy's got a violent streak a mile wide. If he's as violent as you say, be careful. Right. Speaking of motive, Winston Hope seems to have a pretty good one. You're saying his art collection would be worth a lot less if York stayed alive? Yeah. What about our other suspects? The only others who knew York was alive are Philip Graff, Lizanne York, Renee Nurian, Maureen Gilman, and you. Well, we'll stay on all of them. Della, I'd like you to chase the money trail. What money? The York forgery seemed to lie at the bottom of all this. I want to know where the profits went. Ken, I've been thinking about you and Blakely. I don't want any violence, so I'll go see him. 36 hours, 36 hours. The hearing starts in 36 hours. That's not a lot of time to come up with a lot more than we have right now. Hope it's okay I drop by. Um, well, I was expecting someone else. You got a minute? Yeah, I guess. Come on in. I better put something on. Well, you don't have to change it on my account. Didn't seem to bother you yesterday. It shouldn't bother me. After a while, it didn't bother me. Uh, look, work is one thing. It's what I do for a living, but outside of work, it's an entirely different ballgame. Especially with a man I hardly even know. We could get to know each other. So, what do you want? I just wanted to confirm that you and Damien Blakely were together the night that Truman York was murdered. I told you we were. Yeah, I know, but I thought maybe if he wasn't around, you might remember it differently. I remember it exactly the way it was. We were together here the entire night. Are you and he a uh, couple? You know, a long time ago we were. We still go out a lot, and um, every once in a while we end up in bed together for old time's sake, I guess. So you're not seeing anybody special right now? Is that your business? No, it's not, but I figured maybe some night we could have dinner together. Um, look, I think you've got the wrong idea about me. I don't have any idea about you, except that I thought maybe it might be nice to spend a quiet evening together. All right, why don't you just give me a call? But I'm expecting somebody, and it might look kind of funny if you were here. Yeah, okay. So what about tonight? Dinner. Yeah, but you know what? I really got to get Well, I'll pick you up at eight. Okay. The 
It's the last painting I have left of Truth. It's very good. Yes, it's also the reason why I was having dinner at Chez Louis with Winston Hope that night. What time did he take you home? Oh, about 11.15. You were together the whole evening? Yes. Except for about a half an hour. Half an hour? Mm, Winston excused himself, said he had to make a business call. But he was gone for so long, I was ready to walk out. When he finally came back, very apologetic. Said he had trouble getting an overseas line. Again, I like your work. Thank you. But I'm afraid if they were really good, they'd be in other people's houses instead of mine. Do you know uh, Rene Nurian? Yeah, I've met her a few times. Gallery openings, that kind of thing. What about Damien Blakely? The painter? I've heard the name. That's about all. Of course you know Philip Graff. Of course. For years. He's also a neighbor. I thought he lived on the other side of town. Well, he does, but maybe you don't know this about Philip. He started as a painter himself. When he couldn't make a go of it, he uh, opened the gallery. But he still sort of plays at it. He has a small studio in the same building where I have mine. Well, goodbye, Mrs. York. You've been a great help. Mae Nurian is a damn liar. I don't know where she got her fake Yorks from, if that's what they are, but it sure as hell wasn't from me. If not you, who? How would I know? Look, I don't have to steal, and I don't have to forge anybody's work. Because you're a big success? Because I sure as hell am going to be. Bigger than that phony York ever dreamed of, especially after my show next week. What if Nurian cancels the show? I'll sue it for every cent she's got. No. It's understandable. The painter works for years and years. Never really develops a style of his own. But he's got to live. So he rips off the work of a more successful artist. Get out of here. Why don't you just tell me? I said that... get out of here. Look, Blakely. Get the hell out of here. You... Break my hand. My painting hand. I can always get you the name of a good lawyer. So you started out as an artist model. And you grew up in the Northeast, went to college in Colorado, and became a lawyer. We've been over all that. Yeah, I guess we have. So you ever posed for Truman York? Once. But he was so strung out on coke, he never finished the painting. Well, that's too bad. What do I care? I've run into a lot of whacked out painters in my time. That's how I got into print work. People are saying, and the money's a lot better. I said that before, too, didn't I? Yeah, I guess so. You know, I've got this early call for this gig tomorrow, so, um, maybe you could take me home? Yeah, sure. Okay. Check, please. Look, it's not even 10 o'clock. Is something bothering you? Well, there's nothing bothering I mean, me. Because if there is, I could come up, we can have a cup of coffee and talk about it. It's just too late. And remember, I warned you that you may have the wrong idea about me. Well, what about if I call you tomorrow night? I don't think so. Thank you for dinner, though. Maybe you could help me out. Maybe. Maybe not. Do you remember Miss Sikorsky coming here with a man named Damien Blakely a week ago Saturday night? Damien Blakely? Yeah, they're old friends. He's an artist type about my height. Evidently, they go out a lot. 
Doesn't go out a lot with anyone you described. Well, who does she go out a lot with? Who knows? I guess what I mean is, she goes out a lot with someone else. Matter of fact, if she keeps her pattern, she'll probably be heading out again any minute. What kind of car does she drive? Red and gray Mustang, parked right out front. Thanks. to screw around. Let's take five minutes among ourselves and get this all worked out. Okay? I'll be back. Hi, gorgeous. Hey. So, what's the evil word? The evil word is very good. I got the money. I got all the money. The whole 35000 mm -hmm. Beautiful, babe. Beautiful. Yeah, and not only did Hope have artwork in his office, he had photos, personal stuff. His climbing expeditions, racing stints, stuff like that. I still think Blakely's our man. He's a serious contender. Contender? Blakely must have found out that York was at his wife's studio and killed him so that York couldn't expose him as a forger. Tell him, it may be difficult. I'll need the phone records of every public phone booth within a block or two of the Nurian Gallery. What for? If you're right about Blakely, it could help prove he was the anonymous caller who tipped off Joel. I'll get on it right away. Oh, and uh, I located Professor Bainsworth. Joel, see if the professor has a copy of that tape. And tomorrow afternoon, I'll have those financial records. The hearing's at 10. 6 p.m., all right. Right now, I'm betting Blakely's records are the only ones that count. He's not the only suspect. Barry, this is our murderer. Yes. Miss Gilman had told me she had seen Truman in New York, and he was staying at the Brown Palace. I had my driver take me there. So you heard Mr. York give the cab driver the address of Mrs. York's studio at 122 Market Street, did you not? I suppose I did, but I didn't go there. You can ask my driver. I did. But he only works for you during the day. Mr. Hope, why were you going to York's hotel? I had paid a very high price for one of his paintings. York claimed it was a fake. I wanted to find out why. Now, would you please tell the court where you were on the evening of Mr. York's murder? Certainly. At her request, I had dinner with Lisa York to discuss my purchase of one of her husband's paintings. Which you did not buy. Well, at the present time, <clears throat> I'm experiencing a small cash flow problem. And Mr. York's Lazarus-like return from the dead would have caused a serious decline in the value of his paintings. Perhaps. And perhaps... You were about to lose the more than $1 million you'd paid the Nurian Gallery for a painting that was being called a fake. Mr. Hope, where did you and Mrs. York dine that evening? Chez Louis. Very fine food, Chez Louis. And during dinner, you were absent for approximately one half hour. I know, it was very rude. 
but I urgently had to make an overseas phone call. Isn't Che Louis only four short blocks from the studio where Mr. York was murdered? I really don't know. One half hour would be plenty of time for a man to travel four blocks, commit a murder, and return to a restaurant to finish that wonderful dinner. Objection. Argumentative. Move to strike. Sustained and granted. Mr. Hope, you have some photographs on your office wall. In one of them, you are part of a mountain climbing expedition. So what? So, whoever killed Mr. York had to climb to the roof and then rappel to the floor below. A skill with which you are more than familiar. Objection, Your Honor. I have no further questions. Mr. Fryman. Mr. Hope. I have never climbed a mountain. Now, the distance between the skylight and the floor of the studio is roughly 16 to 18 feet. In your opinion, could an inexperienced climber like myself have been able to make such a vast descent? Of course, anybody in this room could have done that. That's including the judge. <laughs> One more question, Mr. Hope. Do you have any proof that you did indeed make an overseas call from the phone booth at Chez Louis? As a matter of fact, the bill arrived yesterday, and the call was charged to my credit card. You think you might bring us a copy of that bill, Mr. Hope? Mr. Mason might find it interesting reading. I read it. I have it right here. Nothing further. Witness may step down. Next witness. Mr. Mason. The defense calls Philip Graff. Mr. Graff, at my request, you examined a group of paintings allegedly executed by Truman York, paintings purchased from the Nurian Gallery over the past few years. Is that correct? Yes. And what was your opinion, your opinion, of those paintings? Each and every one of them was a fake. Uh, brilliantly executed, but nonetheless forgeries. You're sure? Mr. Mason, I have been Truman York's art dealer for 15 years. I know the entire body of his work. Including the ones York was shipping to you from Mexico after he was dead. Yes, those two. No further questions. Mr. Fryman. Oh, nothing, Your Honor. Mr. Mason. Please call Rene Nurian to the stand. Every York painting I bought and then sold was supplied to me by Damien Blakely. Weren't you just a little suspicious as to where Blakely got those paintings? No. No? No? Thank you, Miss Nurian. No more questions. Mr. Fryman. And no questions. No more questions? No more questions, Miss Norian. You must step down. Hmm. Defense calls Damien Blakely. <clears throat> Mr. Blakely, we've heard Renee Norian testify that you were her sole supplier of the alleged York painting. Alleged? Hell, they were genuine. Where did you obtain those paintings? Different collectors. Why didn't they sell their paintings through uh, legitimate dealers? Okay. I know this will probably get me in trouble, but... You see, word got around that I could uh, wash them. Wash them? Well, you know, launder them. They'd give me the paintings, and I'd arrange a sale where they wouldn't have to pay any capital gains tax. Uh, you also heard Philip Graff testify that all those paintings were fakes. Yeah. Well, maybe Mr. Graff has his reasons for saying that. Like maybe he wanted to keep the prices up on the Yorks he was smuggling in from Mexico. Mr. Blakely, is it true you paint in various styles? Yes. But if you're implying that I forged those paintings, forget it. I never forged anybody's work in my life. I've heard you say that before. 
Now, where were you at the time Truman York was murdered? Oh, I spent the night with a model I uh, work with, Mala Sikorsky. No more questions, but I reserve the right to recall this witness. Mr. Fryman? No questions. Witness is excused, subject to recall. Defense calls Mala Sikorsky. Raise your right hand, please. Do you swear to tell the truth? Do you think this could be our whole case? I do. I think so, too. Why don't you ask me what I think? Miss Sikorsky, you just heard Damien Blakely testify that you and he spent the night of the murder together. Yes. And before this trial began, you signed a statement to that effect. Yes, I did. Was that signed statement true? No, it was not. And you have no knowledge of Mr. Blakely's whereabouts on that night? No, none. Why were you willing to lie for Mr. Blakely? He gave me $35,000. You were willing to perjure yourself for money? Yes. You no longer need the money? No, I need the money very much. My husband is in the hospital dying of hepatic encephalopathy caused by drug abuse. I'm the one that got him hooked on drugs. I kicked the habit, but he couldn't. I'm working with a friend of mine on a drug program, and we're trying to collect money. But I need money now for my husband's hospital bills. You see, we don't have any insurance, so no matter how much I work, the money's never nearly enough. So I thought I would pick up a fast 35000 from Damien. I'm sorry I lied, but when you love someone, you do things. And I'd probably do it again. But I'm not lying now. I don't believe you are. Thank you. No further questions. Okay, okay. You see, after that uh, guy from your office called, I figured I might be a suspect or something, and it'd be better if I had an alibi. So I made the deal with Mala. You know, but I had nothing to do with killing York. I didn't even know the guy. Mr. Blakely, what if I told you that moments after you followed Truman York out of the Nurian Gallery, a phone call was made to Joel McKelvey's studio? I wouldn't know what you're talking about. Mr. McKelvey is prepared to testify. It was your voice telling him Truman York was at the Brown Palace. So I made the call. So what? I... So you made the call. Why? Well, I was worried York might get me into some trouble I didn't deserve. I mean, and of course, everybody knew the way McKelvey felt about York. So I thought maybe if he knew where York was, he'd, uh, you know, he'd do something. Like what, sir? Well, like murder. Him. Like murder. Mm hmm? Mr. Blakely, isn't it true that you killed Truman York because you were afraid he would reveal your forgeries? No. And you've got nothing to back that up. Oh, yes, I have. Right here. I have no further questions at this time, and I reserve the right to recall the witness. No questions. Then this witness is excused. The court is recessed till 10 o'clock tomorrow morning. What the hell are you trying to do to me, Mr. Mason? 
Nothing, Mr. Graff. I was only attempting to get everything in this case before the court. That business of the paintings from Mexico could ruin me. Mr. Graff, Joel McKelvey isn't the only one who might have had reason to kill York. That's a key element of our defense. But if I accused anybody, it was Damien Blakely. Yes. <laughs> well, you're way off base there, too. What makes you think so? Because there is no way that a mediocre hack like Blakely could possibly have faked those paintings. They're simply too good. He's right. Perry, I think you should look at these right away. Financial records? More of Blakely's, but very important. Why don't you just give me a summary? Over the last three and a half years, Blakely has deposited a, a series of sizable checks from Renee Nurian. For the fake Yorks? And each time, he immediately withdrew half the amount in cash. So he was paying somebody off? Evidently. Yeah, but who? Ken, go to Blakely's studio. Wait for him if you have to. Tell him I need to talk to him tonight, and I don't care how late it is. He won't be thrilled to see me. I have to speak to him before I get him back on the stand. On my way. I can't face it anymore. Sorry about everything. Damien. I touched the note before I thought about fingerprints. It's okay, Mr. Malansky. Well, too bad for you guys. This note isn't a little more specific. What does that mean? It means at least he could have confessed to York's murder. As it is, your guy is still on the hook, and your number one suspect has just been wheeled out of his door. He says in the note, sorry about everything. Well, he could have meant that he was sorry about the paintings that he forged. This guy was facing some pretty stiff charges. Until tonight, it didn't seem to bother him. <laughs> well, evidently, it bothered him enough to put a bullet through his head. Maybe. We found his gun registration, sir, and it's a match. That doesn't mean it was suicide. Counselor, his gun, a suicide note, he's facing serious charges, maybe even a murder rap. Now, are you saying that it is not suicide, Counselor? In court this afternoon, Blakely walked off the stand as if he didn't have a care in the world. He looked as smug as he does in this picture. Something wrong, Perry? No. Brock's just helped me figure out who killed York and Blakely may be impossible to prove, but you can't call it wrong, can you? No. Uh, no. Yes, I'm currently chairman of the Department of Fine Arts at Midwestern University, and prior to that, I was professor of art at Lincoln College here in Colorado. And for the past 10 years, you've been engaged in collecting videotape interviews of American painters. Yes. Dr. Bainsworth, would you briefly explain your methodology? Certainly. 
I tape the interviews, and they may last as long as three or four hours, and then have them computerized. Now, in that way, my students and other researchers may either view the entire film or access the artist with a specific question. In other words, if one enters a question through an electronic keyboard, the response will appear on a video screen. Your Honor, I object to this entire line of questioning as totally irrelevant and diversionary. The purpose of Dr. Bainsworth's testimony is to lay a foundation for the appearance of my next witness. And who is your next witness, Counselor? I would like my next witness to be, in essence, Truman York. What's going on here, Your Honor? Mr. Mason is insulting this court. Truman York is dead. But he is recorded for many hours on videotape in interviews conducted by Dr. Bainsworth. Your Honor. Just a moment, please. Are you saying it is your wish to cross-examine a videotape? Well, yes, Your Honor. First question, please give us your name. Truman York is the real name. My parents were uh, ardent Democrats. Second question, how long have you been painting? Well, I guess you could say I've been painting uh, since I was about three years old when I, uh, when I decided that the family dog looked, <laughs> looked better with green stripes. <laughs> yeah, but seriously, I guess. I, I guess uh, high school, I realized that I wanted to be a professional artist. Question three. Do you believe there are any specific rules to the creation of art? I think there's a basic truth uh, to art, and that's that there are no limits or rules. Uh, if there were, it would cease to be the full and free expression of the individual, which is what art is, <laughs> or at least what it should be. Your Honor, how long are we to be subjected to this? Will there be a point, Mr. Mason? I believe so, Your Honor. Very well, proceed. Last question. Are there any rules which you as an artist impose upon yourself? Well, uh, my one imperative is, is, that, is, is that I never do the same thing twice. See, or if I'm unable to, to, to capture the essence of a subject, um, I realize there's a there's a lack of, of, of necessary empathy, and I'm, you know, I'm, I'm out of here. <laughs> I'm on to the next thing. Thank you, Professor Bainsworth. Thank you very much. I have no further questions. Mr. Freiman? At my house, my 10-year-old son plays the video games. No questions. Defense calls Lizanne York. No, I'm afraid I didn't know Damian Blakely. Then, of course, you've never been to his studio. No. As you know, Mrs. York, the subpoena that brought you here today also required you to bring with you what you claim to be the last painting of your late husband that you still own. You didn't have to subpoena me or the painting. I would have been happy to bring it here voluntarily. Nevertheless, I would like you to identify it for us. Yes, that's mine. Indicating the painting of a girl reading a book on a balcony. That was painted by your husband, Truman York? Of course. Defense requests that the painting be marked Exhibit D for identification. It will be so marked. Now, Mrs. York, I'd like to show you another painting. This painting belongs to Winston Hope and it has hung in his office for many years. In light of your husband's imperative about never painting the same subject twice, can you explain what has happened here? Obviously, Mr. Hope's paintings are fake. I have no more questions at this time, but I reserve the right to recall the witness. Granted. Does the district attorney wish to cross-examine? No, Your Honor. The witness is excused, subject to recall. Defense recalls Philip Graff. I apologize for recalling you, Mr. Graff, but do you recognize this? Oh, yes, of course. Winston Hope bought this painting at the very first showing of Truman York's work. They actually was a favorite of True's. 
I had to talk him into parting with it. Your Honor, I ask that this painting be marked Defense Exhibit E for identification. It will be so marked. Mr. Graff, as Truman York's dealer for more than 15 years, did you ever know him to repeat a subject in his work? No, absolutely not. Truman was an absolute stickler about that. Then, how do you explain the painting there? Mrs. York testified it was painted by her husband. I can only assume that it is a fake. Thank you, Mr. Graff. No further questions. Mr. Fryman? Nothing, Your Honor. Witness is excused. Thank you. I recall Lausanne York can request I be allowed to question her as a hostile witness. Granted. Mrs. York, isn't it true that you and Damien Blakely were business associates? I don't know what you're talking about. The two of you were in the business of selling forged paintings. Forgeries of your husband's work, selling them to the Nurian Gallery and possibly others. That's ridiculous. I didn't even know Damien Blakely. Blakely was the one who slipped the fakes into the art market, but you were the one who painted them. You were the one who painted the forgeries. That's crazy. Mrs. York, we know this painting is genuine. So according to your husband's own words, this one must be a fake. I submit in the four years you lived with York, you managed brilliantly to copy his exact technique and style. Your forgeries fooled everyone, everyone except your husband. If anyone was forging Truman's paintings, it must have been Damien Blakely. You and Mr. Blakely had a great thing going, didn't you? But it was threatened by your husband's sudden reappearance. Which of you decided York must be killed? Which of you decided Blakely should call Joel McKelvey so he could be set up to take the fall? This is all a lie. I submit that Damien Blakely murdered your husband the very evening you were having dinner with Winston Hope, a dinner intended to give you an alibi. But then suddenly, suddenly, Mrs. York, it became apparent to you evidence was piling up against Blakely. You knew if he were arrested for York's murder, he'd name you. You're making all this up. So, Mrs. York, you went to his studio and calmly, calmly shot him dead. You didn't have to break in. Both of you had keys. His suicide note was an easy matter for a master forger, wasn't it? No. Why are you doing this to me? I told you before, I didn't even know Damien Blakely. Oh, that's right, I forgot. You didn't even know Damien Blakely. Mrs. York. We are showing you a blow-up of a photograph of Damien Blakely appearing on an advertising brochure for his exhibit at the Nurian Gallery. We'll mark this, Your Honor, Defense Exhibit F. No objection. It will be so marked. And this is a blow-up of a police photo taken at the scene of Blakely's alleged suicide, which we'll mark as Defense Exhibit G. No objection. It will be so marked. If you'll notice, both pictures feature the same chair and the same stand. In the police photograph, there is something missing. A piece of metal sculpture on the stand. This morning at 719, at my request, the police obtained a warrant, searched your studio, and found that. Look familiar? It should. It's the sculpture missing from the second photograph. Mrs. York, how did your original sculpture get to Damien Blakely's bedroom before he was killed? And how did it end up in your studio after he was killed? I don't know.
I submit that after you shot and killed Damien Blakely, you took the sculpture so there would be no apparent link between you. But there was a link, wasn't there? A very deadly one. A deadly conspiracy. You conspired to kill your husband, and you murdered Damien Blakely, didn't you? I, I'm sorry, I didn't hear you. You conspired to kill your husband, and you murdered Damien Blakely, did you not? Well, I had to. Don't you see? Truman nearly destroyed me. He was a monster. Couldn't let him do that to me again. So I let Damien kill him. But he wasn't really dead. Not really. I saw Truman every time I looked in Damien's eyes. I just had to get free. You can understand that, can't you? Can't you? I understand that you conspired to murder your husband and then conspired to put the blame on Joel McKelvey for that murder. I understand that you did murder Damien Blakely. Do you understand all those things, Mrs. York? Your Honor, I move that all charges against Joel McKelvey be dismissed. Your Honor, the people have no objection. Motion granted, Mr. Mason. The defendant is free to go, and I order the witness, Lizanne York, be held on two charges of first-degree murder. This court is now adjourned. Thank <laughs> you.